Welcome, everybody. I will call the meeting to order. Um, All right, well, hmm. I'm hearing some echo from somewhere. Yeah, Donna, it's showing you still being unmuted, but, huh. And you, Bill? Is the council chambers one space in their meeting? Okay, I'm going to start talking. We still, oh, your speaker. That's, yeah, <laughs> it's not you, Donna. All right. All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, a note to anyone who's uh, joining us remotely. If you are participating remotely, we'd appreciate it if you would uh, enter your first and last name as your uh, participant name on your screen. Um, anyone who wishes to speak, you would need to, will need to be uh, recognized by the chair. And please start by stating your name and where you live. We ask you to keep all your comments to a total of three minutes, and Councillor Bate will. Uh, be giving a one minute warning and that will be at two minutes. And then at when we get to three minutes, you will be out of time and we'll be asked to, uh, to discontinue. Um, we'd ask you to keep all your comments germane to the topic at hand. And uh, if you have multiple comments or questions, please get them all out at one time so the council can listen to your thoughts and, uh, and then have a discussion, whatever discussion we see, uh, see fit. Um, first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Is everybody satisfied with the agenda? Okay. The agenda is approved. Next item on the agenda is uh, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address uh, the council on an item, any matter that is not on the agenda. And uh, again, uh, we will limit comments to two to three minutes, and uh, please uh, raise your hand and indicate uh, either in uh, in person or on online if you wish to be recognized. And I will. Uh, I, I've see, I first saw a hand on online, so we'll start there with uh, Elaine Ball. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Elaine Ball. And I am here to ask uh, the council and or the mayor to declare this June Pride Month in Montpelier. We are going to be hosting our second annual Montpelier Pride Festival the first weekend in June um, with a celebration on the State House lawn on June 3rd from 1 to 4 and other events sort of throughout the week leading up to and following that weekend. So um, I would appreciate greatly if we could include um, Montpelier's declaration at some point in our festivities, if that might be an option, or at least to be able to share out to the community on Front Porch Forum, Facebook, and all of that, um, the city's support. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Um, do you have, uh, or could you get us a uh draft language that would go into a, a proclamation. I'm sure we would be uh, supportive of doing that. Yes, thank you. I can get some draft language to you. Is there a good time or who should I send it to? Send it to me at City Hall and then we can, um, we'll put it on the next agenda. Thank you. For June. Great, thanks. Anybody else online looking to be recognized? 
I'm not seeing anyone, but if I miss someone, I'm sure someone will point it out to me. Okay, Steve MacArthur. I, I did hear you say that the questions that are uh, on the agenda need to be asked later on. I just need to make sure that the state is here uh, and will be talking with you tonight. And if there will be an opportunity after that discussion for there to be questions from the floor. About if the not, I want to make some comments now. Well, there's so, so I we invited the state. And is there someone from yep, state is here. Okay, so great. We'll be discussing that. We'll be discussing yes, we'll be yeah. public. Thank, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the room wishes to be heard at this point? Okay. We will move on to the uh, next item, which is the consent agenda. Um, I believe we had a request to uh, take the Barry Street feasibility study agreement off the consent agenda. I'm not sure if that's still a live uh, request. I was through with the question. Okay. And is uh, everyone happy with the consent agenda then? So can I just mention, can I ask that you all approve the minutes with a uh, a modification on them? I used one set of letters for the consent agenda. There were two sets out there, and I guess I picked the wrong one. So I would just ask that you all approve the minutes uh, without the the letters. Um, I'm not sure how to put this, but without the uh, letter notations on the consent agenda, and that would solve the problem. Oh, right. There were two different versions, and they had different letters. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. But to avoid confusion, I'm just saying take them out completely, and I'll just leave the descriptions in. Okay. Uh, I move the consent agenda with the minutes. Second. All right. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none. All those. Oh, sorry, Peter. I was just told you have your hand up, Peter Kelman. Just a clarification. Did you take the Barry Street item off the consent agenda? We did not. We have we've had some uh, emails, and I believe that that uh, request is uh, no longer a live request. Is are you still requesting that it be off the consent agenda? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm I'm happy with that. Do you want to amend your motion to do that? Street feasibility study agreement from the consent agenda. And that's seconded also. All right. Um, rather than move vote on that uh, proposed amendment, let's just vote on the uh, consent agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? Okay. Next we have item E. The 55 Barry Street Feasibility Study Agreement. Could you give us a little? I I can. I guess I would ask the person who requested that it be pulled off. Uh, for, I think for the short version is the council had asked us to get uh, a price to take a look at the building, uh, what code improvements it might need, uh, and in, to look at it not only for sh potential short-term upgrades for shelter purposes, potential shelter purposes, but also to understand larger code issues with that building. We received, we talked to three architects. We received one um, proposal, and that is on your consent agenda from GBA here in Montpelier. Uh, Chris Lumber, our facilities director, is here if you need more detail about the proposal. Um, but it's, in our view, it's pretty straightforward to do what council had asked. Okay, thank you, Peter. Do you want to be heard? Uh, yes, <clears throat> uh, Peter Kelman, Montpelier. Um, I asked that to be taken off because the language of what was posted as the proposal from Tom Backman, I don't think reflected what was intended. And indeed, Chris Lumbra clarified that the what he called 
the original um, um, proposal uh, did state the uh, the the um, goal correctly, but the way it was stated in the what you're being asked to vote on, which is the, the letter of, uh, uh, of of agreement, um, says. Uh, the feasibility study that explores the possibility of converting the Montpelier Recreation Building at 55 Barry Street into a nighttime facility for the unhoused during the winter months. And I've sent to all of you my concerns about this. I think that's not accurate. It's not, and Chris, Chris, Chris's clarification of what was in the original is accurate. So, um, and and but finally, besides what Chris clarified, I I do object to using the term the unhoused. We're not talking about an abstraction here. We're talking about people who at this time happen to be unhoused. That is not a category of people. I'm not objecting to unhoused as an adjective. You wanna say people who are unhoused, people who might be unhoused, that's fine. But to say the unhoused, the poor, the criminal mind, th that is not an appropriate way to refer to people. And this is a matter uh, uh, of uh, diversity, inclusion. And, and it, really, you have to be very careful about the language. But more importantly, if you guys are going to vote on this, you should be voting on what Chris clarified was the, was the original intent, not on this wording. And I reworded it. I said, you could say... Repairs and improvements needed to permit dual use of the Montpelier Recreation Building at 55 Barry Street as a nighttime facility for people who are unhoused during cold weather, not winter months. It's cold weather because it goes from November to April while continuing current recreational programs at other times. I think that's what it should say. Thank you. Thank you. Is it clear to you, Bill, from uh, the knowledge of the of the letter that it encompasses what um, Mr. Kellman is requesting? It does, and I think we don't have any concerns about it. We also don't have any concerns if you want to amend it as per his suggestion. Um, I think either way is accurate. I think uh, also point out that it is 55 Barry Street, not 58 Barry Street. That was another typo that we got in there. Uh, but I, I think we're all pretty clear that the, the person who walked through the building knows what we, you know, we've had a very clear conversation about. However, and Chris? Yeah. This one, this one working? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, do, do introduce yourself, please. Uh, I'm Chris Lumber. I'm the City Facilities and Sustainability Coordinator. Um, yeah. I've been working with uh, GB Architects on this project. And so the, the the document that I may have incorrectly referred to as the original proposal, matter of wording there, is included as part of the scope of work. Um, and part of the scope of work is that that there will be four on-site meetings to clarify the city's wants and needs as this project, in the early stages of this project moving forward, if that's helpful information. And, it, and it's clear that what we're talking about is not a conversion of the building, but the ability to have uh, two uses at different times of the day. Absolutely. Okay. Karen? Yeah, I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Um, I think it's good that we had the opportunity to talk about this so the public can really understand that that's what we're talking about. And I have no concerns that the city staff understands what we're talking about and the people who are going to do the work understand what it is. So that's great. I'm glad that's clarified. Um, I I am just noting that in um, the original letter that they sent of interest, I think it was, they talked about the timeline being extremely short and concerns about the ability to get any kind of work done in time for people to actually be staying there by the time the weather gets cold enough that we need it. And so that's not that, that's not a, a question about whether we should approve this. I think we should approve this and go ahead and do this. But I just want to take the opportunity, since we don't have other time on the agenda to talk about this, to, to note that and to note that, um, as far as I'm concerned, the priority is to have a place for people to be sheltered in cold weather when it comes around again. And if it's the rec center, 
great. If it's not the rec center, then it needs to be somewhere else. And we really need to be committed to finding some place, whether or not this is it come a few months from now. And without belaboring the conversation, I'd simply say we agree with you and are actively looking not only at this site, but our options. Okay. Anybody else? Just curious. Are there any other real options? Because if there aren't, we really should move ahead with this one. So the only other gut feeling that we should do. Right. Well, I, I mean, I think we would all agree, at least as far as city owned facilities, that is probably the preference. The question is just, you know, can we get the work done or can we get variances that we need in time? So, mm, yeah. Uh, I mean, the only other city facility city facility that we have that we control would be the Elks Club. The location is great, but the facility. Mm -hmm. So that's one fallback, and we've floated that, and then we've been talking to um, other locations in the community that are not city owned and having conversations with the owners of those properties and okay. I think those organizations to see if those can work or what we're ready to. Yeah. Talk about that in public. But Carrie's right. I mean, we need oh, to agree. make a choice by the next meeting. I would think if we have any chance of having a facility ready in November. Lauren. Flagging that, Peter. Can you not hear me? But I'm lying. Um, no, you're not audible. The question I have is, um, is there a parallel effort happening? I know it was brought up that like staffing and operations is going to be the other challenge. Like, is that happening in parallel? Um, just because we need to get that all lined up as well as the building itself. So. Yes. In fact, we had you know a meeting last night of all the or many of the providers in the other two communities uh, here in this room. We're meeting again next week. Uh, I think there is a commitment to provide sheltering services if we can find a location. Uh, and you know, obviously, we're also looking regionally and as well as in in the city with our partners. So to see what's out there. And you know, as far as the rec center goes, I mean, I there's no desire to hold this up. It's just some of the improvements like sprinklers or other things. If we can't get variances, just, it's just a question of getting contractors to do the work. It's not a desire to do it. So it's, it, we're, we're move, trying to move as fast as we can, but in today's environment, things can take a year plus to get work done. So we may have to find an, at least for one winter, a different location. I'm ready for a motion. As it's in the packet. As in the packet. Okay. Is there a second? Oh, second. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. We're moving to item number six, an update from our assessor. Uh, I'm Marty Ligerson. I'm the assessor of the city assessor. And I just want to give a brief update on the... Um, Marty, you'll probably want to be a lot closer to the microphone. Um, a brief update on the project that's been going for the last two years. For Can the, you hear in the back? For the reappraisal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Um, the, th the first thing I gave everybody a handout is uh, a letter addressed from the, uh, the city assessor's office. Uh, this is going to go in the mail starting tomorrow. And this is going to be mailed to every every property owner. Um, talks about who we contracted with, uh, the process, and what the next steps are going to be for the homeowners. <clears throat> As you'll see on the top, everybody's you know, it's going to have, it's going to be individualized to every property owner. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have on the city's website, we're going to have a, a quick link that will bring people right to the, the assessor's page. And it's going to have a, a printout of the grand list that anybody can print, they can look at. Mm -hmm. um, and then what the next steps are, if anyone feels aggrieved by the new numbers. Um Towards the end, you'll see the informal hearings. We're going to have approximately 355 slots available 
for people to come in. It's kind of a, it's an informal, informational. People come in, ask questions. Sometimes people don't understand their their appraisals. It's a quick ten minute um, meeting with anybody that wants to come in. That will go for about a week, and then formal grievances will follow after that. Um, it's got all our contact information on there and how to get a hold of us, how to schedule it. Any questions about the letter? Yeah, Marty, will um, will people be getting uh, a hard copy of the entire grand list in the mail in the mail the way we have in previous years? We will not. Um, so the re we're gonna we're gonna have it available on the website for people to download. Um, we're still kind of up in the air on whether we're gonna print a couple and have them here on site for people to look at. So we can go either way with that. I would encourage you to do that. I think okay. you will want that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Was there any other questions before we move? There's one one more handout. So this is um, this is from the the company that did the uh, the reappraisal for us. It's statistics of what what we've seen in the growth of the grand list. Um, I'm sure you're going to have questions. People are going to ask you uh, in the next couple of days. The the uh, grand list as proposed right now is a billion. Three hundred fourteen million six hundred seventy-eight thousand six hundred. It's going to change a little bit as we get through the grievance process, of course, um, and that's a four hundred fifty-six million dollar growth over last year's grand list. Um, it talks about why this is a good appraisal. Um, the state does a three-prong test to make sure that any um, citywide reappraisal meets their requirements. This meets all the all the requirements. All the, the CODs are right in line. The medians are right where they should be. Uh, the list CODs? Yeah. Um, coefficient of dispersion. That just means that everybody's being treated equally. Okay. There's nobody way down here. There's nobody way up here, over-assessed, under-assessed. Everybody falls in line. Uh, mm -hmm. The COD is something that triggers when you need a reappraisal. If you get to be too high, that means you're not treating everybody equitably. So that can cause uh, a reappraisal order from the state. Can you be louder, please? I think we're still having trouble in the back. Yeah. What part? No, just well, just talk louder. Well, just okay, talk just in mic. general. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so is in the listing, some some people may want to know how many properties they got into. They got into over seventy two percent internal inspections in the homes, which was it's up a little bit more than it was back in twenty ten. So they they had great cooperation from from the public. Um, and then and then like it says here the. Uh, in, in informal hearings, they'll be coming up in uh, uh, two weeks. Grievances will follow after that. And there's also a couple of, um, this is statistically, this is this is what tells us that we have a great appraisal. Um, the next handout is, um, there's, one, two, three, there's about 10 different categories and it gives the parcel count old values, new values, the differences, and the percentage that they grew up uh, uh, grew. So if you look to the far right of it, you'll see 1.58. So our one homestead are homes under six acres, and they're up 58%. So you can you can kind of go down the, the list there, and you can see um, anything over six acres, that's up 54%. So this shows the increase in value of the grand list from this year to last, uh, uh, the last grand list. Um, and then the last page, those are sales. Whenever we do a citywide reappraisal, we have to do a sales study um, of the previous three years of sales. So the, the smaller handout, that's an analysis of all the sales from the last three years that we had used in the study. And they fall right in line. The um, the ratio, the percentages, those, those match right up with the entire grand list the way they're supposed to. Um, so I'm 100% confident in... Uh, turning out the grand list. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Lauren. Sure. <clears throat> like, do you anticipate that these are numbers that are going to be good for a while or was were we catching it in a weird market? Um yeah, it's it's a funny question. Um we did get a lot of pushback, but the way the way that the real estate market seems to be going and I know Tim will vouch for this, it doesn't it's not going backwards. You know, um, these numbers are going to last us for probably for eight or 10 years, I would guess. The way it's going now, maybe less. Um, the state's contemplating taking over the reappraisal and making it 
mandatory to go every four to six years anyhow. So, but I, I have confidence that this is going to last for for quite a while. Was there you said you had a second question too? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question because that's you're going to get that a lot. Everyone's going to look at this and say, you know, if um, values are up 58 percent, my taxes are going to go up 58 percent, and that's that's not true. So what happens now is the tax rate will be adjusted. Um, we have we just came up today with a temporary tax rate, which we're going to put on the website also, um, so people can plug their assessment, their new assessments, into a calculator, and it will give them an estimate. It's just going to be a really rough estimate because we don't have you know, post grievance numbers yet for the tax rate. Um, but that'll get them a pretty good idea of where they should be. So um, one of the analogies I've been giving people is like filling a bathtub up with, you know, when you have a bathtub full of toys, you fill it with water, everybody kind of rises at the same level. So we'll adjust the tax rate accordingly. Right. I think, you know, one one way to look at that, just to help help out on that is, um, you know, sometimes there's a, a misperception that, that th this grand list, you know, we have 58, 55% uh, growth in the grand list, we're going to get 55% more dollars, but that's not true. The budgets were approved in March. That's, it's just going to be redistributed differently. So if there were no increase at all in the budget, if it was, stri if it was strictly the same, um, then the tax rate would go down by the 58% or 55% that the grand list goes up. Now there will, it won't be exact because our budgets and the school budgets went up a little bit, but it will be in that ballpark in terms of tax rate. Uh, and, and then when the final grand list is set, then the actual tax. Rate. So I think you can tell people that, you know, roughly the tax rate will be about half of what it was. And I think that'll be pretty close. Well, I could, I, I'll, I'll get to carry I can just tell you and everyone in city government that this is a question that is, or this is an explanation that's going to have to go out many times and be very clear because with all my years on the board of civil authority, I know that people uh, don't get it when we explain it. So that it's going to be a major uh, effort. Uh, yeah, we have a letter on our on the assessors page, and we will update it also as as questions come in for sure. Uh, Carrie, yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate all this. Um, so I wanted to follow up on the question that Lauren asked mm -hmm. about this being a kind of a tricky time in sure. the market and. Uh, if you could clarify what are the triggers for another reassessment if it turns out that something really crazy does happen in the market in the next few years? Um, so right now there's there's two triggers. A CLA, which is a common level of appraisal, um, if that gets below 85%, the state comes in and says you need to do a reappraisal or the coefficients of dispersion. As I said, if with, with the COD, that's how is everybody being, you know, you have a level line here. And if you have some people that are overassessed, some that are underassessed, and everybody's not being treated equally. So if that gets over 20, that triggers. Um, and these are well, I mean, we just barely got to 74% CLA in the last reval was 13 years ago. It, and the market has been pretty steady up until the last two years. So that CLA, you know, the way things are going now, it's, I, I don't see it lasting another 13 years. If that answers your question, yeah. And and another piece to that, um, the reality is that getting this work done is a good, just like other work right now, is a good two to three years out. So even if we hit these markers and get the one of the reasons we were right on time is we our former assessor saw this coming and we we booked yeah. our folks a couple of years in advance so they'd be ready once we got the notice. Um, yeah. But you know, they're booking two or three years in advance. So, and, and like I said, the, as Marty mentioned, the state is really, they see this as a crisis around the state because there's only so many appraisal firms. So they're trying to, they're looking at putting everybody on a rotating schedule so that the reappraisal firms can schedule their work and cities in the small town. So that just every six years or so you get a reappraisal. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. So a question in the back. Why don't you come on up to the microphone, please? You need to get involved in this. I'm sorry. Uh, Scott Muller, Montpelier. I think it is important what you're saying about the tax, effective tax rate not being changed. There's another important consideration because there is a major change in Montpelier. If you pull the census data from 2015 to 2020, the renter occupied homes in Montpelier increased almost 25% without changing the housing stock. Other states phrase that as investor owned housing 
has increased by 20 plus percent in five year Delta. That was in 2020 before the pandemic. So I would intuit that that's probably changed. So it's just an important data point to consider um, the property value question uh, and the shift in owner to renter ratios. It's more complicated than tax rates. Thanks. Anybody else? Um, thanks for coming in. This Thank is the start of, for those of us on the board of civil authority, this could be the start of a long summer and fall. Thank you. When do we You're all on the board of civil authority. Don't forget. Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that that was actually that was someone's mailing address. So I left that one just to give well. I didn't want to give out the person's information. So I actually found white on that. All right. Item number seven, water and sewer budgets. So as people know, we have a lot of um our main discussion tonight is about water and sewer. The first part is to go through the budget and the, the water the water and sewer budgets and water sewer rates and then discuss the uh issues with the the lines that people have ra have raised. I think many people are here for this conversation. So our consultant will be here to talk about their report. The state will be here to talk about their issues, and certainly there will be public comment at that time. Okay, step right up. Are you are you sharing? Yeah, we're working on okay. it. Good evening, I'm Kurt Modica, Director of Public Works um, with Sarah LaCroix, Finance Director from Montpelier. We're here to talk to you tonight about uh, the water and sewer budgets and uh, proposed rates for the next fiscal year. Um, just a brief overview of the makeup of the water and sewer divisions uh, within Public Works. Um, we currently have uh, five administrative staff. Um, unfortunately, we are losing our, one of our engineers. We'll be down to four. Uh, there are now seven in our um, water and sewer um, division, as well as three water plant operators and four wastewater plant operators. And uh, the major functions um, uh, of these divisions is um, water and sewer uh, treatment and distribution. Um, uh, collection in the sewer, um, permitting, project management, and financial planning. And um, just briefly on the financial planning piece tonight, so we're mostly here to talk about um, the uh, the city adopted a water and sewer master plan originally in 2016, and that's really the basis of um, the rates that we propose annually. And that is essentially structured as um, the increase of uh, uh, inflation plus one percent. And that 1% goes to infrastructure improvements annually. Um, and we also uh, updated the master plan in 2021. We plan to update that every five years as conditions change and um, in construction and construction costs, as well as new projects and new um, uh, permit requirements come up. So the chart that you can see here is the expenditures by fund for what's budgeted. Um, I gave this just to give some perspective as to the percentage that is water fund and sewer fund. You can see water fund is 11.7% of total expenditures. 
Sewer is 17.1 for a total of 28.8% of total budgeted expenditures. Um, on, here we'll give a water fund overview. The proposed budget is $3,447,672. This is an increase of $484,000 or 16.37% over the prior year. The original budget that was proposed was an 8.7% increase. After we reviewed the budget and the master plan, we were able to shift two cents of the CSO benefit charge from the sewer fund to the water fund to align with the plan. Um, this also increases funding for infrastructure improvements and is nearly half of the increase you see above. Um, the remainder of the increase is in line with the CPI plus 1% at the time of budget development, which was in October at approximately 8.7%. At this time, consumption is returning to pre-pandemic levels. This increased consumption will allow us to propose a rate increase of only 6.6% to cover this increase in spending for infrastructure. To the right of the slide, you can see the breakdown of the expenses such as water supply and treatment, water distribution system and water administration, uh, along with a few other smaller items. I wanted to point out that in the water administration, 672,000 of this or 47% of that green chunk is related to debt payments for capital improvements. So I just wanted to call that out as it's um, under administration. I would like to move on to the sewer fund. Um, at this time, we've proposed a $5,065,902 budget. That is a $296,000 increase or 6.2% over the prior year. The original proposed budget had an 8.7% increase. After we were able to review this, we were and shifted the two cents of the benefit charge to water. We were able to forecast an increase in revenue from the acceptance of septage and leachate, and we're able to reduce the budget for fuel based on the use of biogas at the plant in the heating process which has allowed for the 6.2% increase. This will result in a 6.6% rate increase to users. Um, and again, on the right, you can see the breakout of water treatment, sewer collection, water administration, and the other components that make up the budget. Here we provided you with the rate change. The proposed rate increase is consistent with the master plan and the prior year's rate setting methodology. Uh, when we reviewed this, CPI in March was 5.6%. So we added the 1% and were able to reduce what we'd originally proposed at the 8.7 down to 6.6, um, just to make sure we were considering the burden on rate payers and we're using this recommended CPI, the lower rate increase. Um, on this slide, you can see the rate changes. Um, when I reference the CPI portion, it primarily relates to the metered and the readiness to serve fees. Um, but the other rate increases were in line and were to cover the cost of labor for those services. In this slide, um, I would just want to provide the last five years worth of rate history and note that our policy is to increase rates at CPI plus one annually. And that began in fiscal year 2018. That, and as Kurt mentioned, that 1% is for infrastructure improvements and reserve. Per our policy, each budget in FY24 should have 7% of budgeted revenue allocated to capital improvements. And as you can see, the water budget has 484,000 or 14%, and the sewer budget has 392,000 or 7.7%. Um, and some history around capital outlay between FY18 and 22, based on this 1%, we needed to allocate $450,000 to infrastructure improvements in the water fund. We were actually able to do $3.5 million worth of capital outlay and um, as far as capitalized infrastructure. There would be other grant funding um, and, and potentially related debt to allow for that big of a, an amount, but to show that we have done significant capital improvements in the water fund. And the same can be said for the sewer fund. Um, at that 1%, we would have had to put $658,000 into capital improvements. And between the sewer plant phase one and additional line improvements, we have capitalized $20 million um, worth of improvements. 
Um, this slide is just to show what the combined impact on rate payers would be. Um, the average family, single family home uses about 10,000 gallons of water. And this rate increase overall is $7.41 per month or $88.92 annually, which is less than a $100 increase annually. On this, while you're on this slide, could you uh, say a word about what the readiness to serve charge is? Yep. So the readiness to serve charge is the fixed fee to cover fixed costs that is spread over all the four quarters. And so just a summary overview, this would be effective July 1 for FY24 for the billing period ending September 30th and due December 15th. As I noted before, this is 5.6% CPI plus 1%, so a 6.6 .6 rate increase. This funds operational expenses, infrastructure improvements, and stabilizes funding for future years. My recommendation is that you approve the water and sewer budgets and utility rates for FY24 and execute the resolution. Um, but I'd like to let Kurt wrap this up and talk about what we have done for capital improvements and what we have upcoming. Okay, this slide may be a little bit hard to see, but um, so we have targets uh, annually outlined in the master plan. So the goal is to replace um, all of the infrastructure, all of the utility pipes uh, over a hundred year period. And there's um, it's broken up into um, basically two phases of, of funding. You know, uh, the f first 50 years was slightly the lower level, and then it increases as debt. Some of the other earlier debt drops off. Um, we were able to put more money into infrastructure. Uh, so the goal in um, through the master plan it, uh, annually for sewer is 2,300 feet, and for water it's 2,750, 2,750 feet. Um, and, you know, there's a, a lot of streets here listed that we've um, replaced since 2016. That's when this um, was started, started to be tracked when the master plan went into place. Um, and so uh, the totals at the end of this year, um, you know, the target in, in sewer is 1,600 feet and we'll have, um, or 16,000 feet, sorry, and we have, we'll have 10,000 feet replaced. And in water, it's 19,000 feet and we'll have um, 16,000 feet. But the one other aspect um, that's that's um, not accounted for looking at straight pipe replacement is is how many pipes we've eliminated. So if there's a lot of uh, a lot of streets in Montpelier that have uh, multiple water mains, um, and so our approach is what we call asset divestment. So if we can um, you know size the new water main appropriately or sewer so um, to handle all the demands on the street. Uh, which we do through our hydraulic model that we'll be talking about shortly. Um, and then we can actually go from two mains on that street to one, which is one less length of pipe that will ultimately have to be replaced. So if you factor in the um, the pipes that we've eliminated as assets within the system, um, then that brings us to um, 18,000 feet of, of um, net replacement um, as opposed to the um, 16,000 in sewer goal. So we're actually ahead of that. And uh, 25,000 feet replaced in water as opposed to the 19,000 foot goal in, um, in the water fund or water pipes. Um, so we're actually doing uh, really well um, as far as uh, you know hitting our targets for a pipe replacement. We did have a slowdown during the pandemic. Um, essentially all construction was shut down. We were right in the middle of a, a large utility replacement project. Um, and there are some challenges that we're facing um, uh, with pipe replacement projects. One is uh, is urban soils. So that's a new regulation where um, there's really a, a much tighter restriction on on how soils are managed that are removed um, from uh, a downtown site. They have to be tested and um, quantified uh, as far as where they can be replaced. If you can put it back in the trench, then that's fine. But generally, you have uh, waste material um, you know, from select backfill around the pipe and, and road base materials. So you end up with a, a waste. And then if that hits a certain threshold for um, like arsenic or other um, uh, minerals within the soil, then um, it has to be uh, brought to the landfill. So it's, a, it's just an extra design step. Um, but it's a little bit uh, challenging as far as the design end of getting this, this, this work done. And then the other piece is, is stormwater. Um, there's a lot of new stormwater regs, uh, East State project that we have coming up um, uh, will require a fairly extensive stormwater treatment practices, um, which is, again, a fair amount of engineering and, and cost for the overall project. 
Um, and then moving on to what we have uh, upcoming for pipe replacement projects. Um, so this this list is is primarily areas that are deficient as far as um, uh, the pipe the pipe being sized adequately to uh, provide fire protection without impacting the rest of the water system, um, without dropping the pressure in the rest of the water system. So there are a number of, uh, through the hydraulic model again, that we'll be talking about uh, shortly, um, there are several areas where, uh, we, where we have hydrants, but the line is too small to support those hydrants. So in order to uh, maintain uh, fire protection in those areas, we have to upsize the piping, um, or potentially we'll have to uh, abandon those hydrants. Um, and, and the other component to the upcoming project list is, is just the areas that we have a lot of failures on. So we're trying to take a mixed approach of um, meeting compliance with our permit, as well as reducing the frequency of water breaks and leaks for those areas that are prone to failure. Um, just and one other thing that the on the sewer side, talking a lot about water, but the sewer side, um, pr these projects are geared primarily around um, combined sewer overflow reduction. Uh, so a lot of uh, the siphons, for instance, is a restriction point. So those those are um, pipes that convey sewage from one side of the river to the other through gravity, and uh, that's a restriction in our system that uh, results in um, sewer overflowing to the river. Uh, so um, you know, increasing those capacities as well as the project we're doing right now on State Street, um, which is sort of a siphon, but not really designed that way. Um, but there's a low point in the sewer main. We're correcting that, which will have a you know a big impact. So again, the sewer side is also um, uh, really geared around um, you know compliance meeting our permit requirements, which CSO reduction is is one of our permit requirements, as well as there are some areas where um, there are problems with the sewer main that's the Terra street line which we had a failure this winter so we're planning to do that um, this year that's it for us i guess if you have questions we're ready okay and so far what we're talking about is just the budget yeah and putting the, the budget in the rates. Will be rates okay Correct. great yep. and then questions relating to Phys physical structure, physical operations, repairs and improvements, those will be on the uh, item number nine. Okay. All right. Any questions from members of the council? So, I noticed on the um, historical budget charts for water and sewer, there were excesses in some years. What happens to that money? Does that go to capital improvement or? Uh, the, what we didn't expend. So. Right. Um, there, the, the, the budget was was above um, the actual cost. Yeah. So um, in the, the years we haven't expended those funds, it sits in an unrestricted fund balance, which is reserved for capital improvements. So at the end of FY22, the water fund had an unrestricted fund balance of 360000 and the sewer fund had an unrestricted fund balance of 930000 So that's available um, for emergencies and for future capital improvements. Okay, yeah. Good, good to, I figured there would be... <laughs> this is my first water budget, so... Uh, um, mine too. <laughs> might be a quick, oh, there you go. All right, so we're in the same boat. And, and is there a plan to... Uh... To expend those funds when uh, the city has this is not as capacity to uh, to do the work, or is it is a plan to keep it there for contingencies? So I, you know, it depends on the projects we do, and of course we don't know what the bid prices come in, so we anticipate that. I think you know water uh, the water is more of a contingency. You know, we have emergency breaks in in, in that amount of money. The the sewer. I would imagine will be redirected into projects. We haven't made a formal decision yet, but you know, nine hundred thousand, we probably could reuse some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a huge sewer treatment plant project coming, so um, the contingencies on that are much larger than normal that could, pipe replacement. That could reduce the bonding. Correct. Yep. Any other questions from the council, uh, Lauren? Addressing inflation and staying on top of um, 
you know, our needs. I'm curious with the unprecedented federal funding available for water projects, like that plan was made before that was available. Are we setting ourselves up to take full advantage? I know the city's been doing a great job going after grants and stuff, but just, you know, we've got this kind of moment in time where there's money in the state that's never been there before, like hundreds of millions of dollars have been allocated for water projects. So just is this setting us up to take full advantage or is this more kind of business as usual, like what we thought we'd want to do in 2016? So this would be this is our budget based on our water rates, what we would do. Anything that we could do with uh grant funding, and we'll probably talk about that in the next yeah, the, you know, the study that we have now is established priority. So that is useful in uh, applying for grants. So that would be work. It would either accelerate work on this list or, you know, ad addition. But the, assuming there was none of that, this is how we would continue proceeding. But yes, all of that is fair game and we'll be going after it aggressively. Tim, did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> And this is a big one. I, I guess I just have to say I'm really uncomfortable with the rate of increase. I mean, I, I'm using CPI as our policy. Um, I've never participated in a budget where that's how you did it. It would seem like usually we use revenues and expenses and mm -hmm. um, and work it through that way. And just arbitrarily saying, well, it's 8.7 this year and we'll add one to that. But we're going to be nice and only make it 6.6. .6. I'm really uneasy with this. I mean, in a community where people are worried about affordability and being able to live here. Um, I mean, the, the budget's here sheet after sheet. Um, there's a lot to take in. I, I don't think, is this a real, is this our policy to do a CPI driven budget? Yeah, it's, the city council said this is a rate policy in 2018, I think. And we followed that ever since. So essentially then we look at that and then figure out the budget that fits within that. Um, obviously, we're going to be where well, we were working on a rate study. I don't know if that's going to be delayed as a result of the capa staff capacity, but I mean, certainly the council could revisit its policy, and I mean, you could now if you wanted, but typically you could do that in, in anticipation of another year. But that that is not a staff set policy; it's a council set policy, and we've and it's been a number of years now we followed it. All the things in our lives now are not driven by CPI, right. and it's just really not the right way to do it. I don't think. Go ahead, Donna. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, fine. I, I, I said my concern. Uh, I was remembering back to that. I was on council at the time. It seemed to me there were times when we weren't doing that and we got behind because of revenue and expenses. And then we had to make a huge increase. And so we were trying to make steady increases that were more proportional. Do, do I not remember that right, Bill? Yeah, so that's why we we did it, and so far it's worked out well. Yeah, you know, the reaction is looking at the slide showing a sixteen point three seven percent increase over the prior prior year. Um, that's really big. I mean, and and these percentages, it's I to say it's a game, but because everybody's trying to choose how they convey information. But it's been a number of years where I I you know, hear the presentations and think, oh, it's only a couple percent or whatever it used to be in the old days. And then then I get my bills and it's like, this isn't a couple of percent. You know, it's like all the fees and everything builds up. And when you get your bill, it's quite a bit higher. Um, and that's why I look at such high starting percentages and go, if you start adding the fixed fees and the other pieces on and the increases in those, this feels like a giant increase. Well, I don't think you're really adding those things onto the percentage because each one is a percentage of a, a, a piece of it, right? The, yeah. Um, do you have you guys have anything to yeah, comment I've, about that? I'll just make a, a comment I forgot to mention earlier on um, construction cost increases. So, with, you know, with a lot of um, federal money coming in to infrastructure. Um, the the contracting environment has gotten a lot more competitive and so we have seen dramatic increases in in bid prices much higher than the cpi increase uh, that's also true for the chemicals at the treatment plant as well as um, construction materials such as pvc have gone up um, i think it's like 60 percent in the last two years so um, we really do need a, a fairly um, 
you know, substantial increase, at least what we've proposed to sort of maintain um, replacing the infrastructure like like we really need to. So, uh, you know, I think, we, you know, we obviously could, um, could go more and we'd support that, but we're trying to, you know, the goal is to try to make it um, manageable for folks uh, through, like Donna said, through sort of slow and steady increases rather than small and then a big jump. As as I think about this, you know, we've got a whole bunch of different components of the cost of operating the system, whether it's the personnel or uh, pipe, that, pipe that we buy or valves or all those things, all of those things are within, are affected by the consumer price index. So we need to be able to address that in our uh, in our pricing, right? Uh, I saw a couple of hands in the back. And Mr. Muller first. Uh, to Councillor Heaney's. Uh, and, and why don't you say your name again? Sure, Scott Muller, Montpelier. Uh, to Councillor Heaney's insightful, he's reading in the accounting what the engineers are reading in the data. The pipes are breaking every five, six, seven days. You're talking about an increase in construction costs. So I guess to keep this in the budget conversation, my question is, you know, looking at all the data from the leak replacements and whatnot, what do you actually estimate is the system leakage? How is that changing over time? And what is that in lost revenue, in lost water revenue? Because it's significant. Have you done those calculations? Thanks. Um, so not recently. We have done in the historically we used to do um, metered versus produced um, calculations. It has been a few years since we've done that. Um, it's a little different. The, um, the lost water um, doesn't translate directly into revenue um, because you're looking at the cost of production rather than the overall um, cost of the system for all the personnel and everything else. Um, so it's certainly something you know that is worth looking at. It's not something that we've recently looked at. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, sir. Mike Chater, Montpelier. Um, questions, a couple of questions. One, I'd like to know if there's comparable data that, that exists that compares us with communities of like size and population, and also uh, data about the the effectiveness of our system and we as all of us know there's been lots of problems um is that something that we have looked at are we worse than others better and if not i i view water as the fundamental level of infrastructure you talk about housing you don't build houses unless you got water you don't do anything else to get water streets we talk about fixing streets i live on terrace street uh, we've rebuilt Terra Street a couple of times, and we still got water problems. Um, I I think we ought to know how we're doing, because I don't think we do now. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have an answer? Is there an answer? Uh, so I mean, we, we do have data on water quality. Um, testing and we can compare that to other people and uh, we have in the past done rate studies and we're on the higher end but not the highest and um, I don't know about you know sort of pipe quality if we have a, a metric for that I don't know of anything yeah I don't know that there's um that there's a published study available for you know the age of pipes compared to other communities um, you know, Montpelier is an, is an older system. Um, I think everybody's uh, aware of that. Um, and like Bill said, there is, there are, um, there is some information that I haven't seen one recently, but in other presentations, we have looked at the rates compared to other communities. And like Bill said, um, we are not the highest, but you know, the rates are relatively high in Montpelier. And we are about to embark on a rate study to take a look at exactly that. Mm -hmm. That's right. One, one thing that Montpelier does not do that most other communities, um, uh, do charge for is allocation fees. So um, whenever there's a new housing development, um, they need a certain amount of gallons per day of water and sewer allocated to serve that property. Um, the city charges a connection fee like other communities do, but there is no fee for allocations. Um, so that's something um, that is gonna be looked at as part of the rate study that we currently have um, going on. Um, 
and then that may be an opportunity to offset some of the rates um, through that through that revenue stream. And what's the timeline on the rate study? Um, well, we had hoped to have it July first. That's that's not going to happen at this point because we are short staffed in our engineering division. Um, you know, it'll be uh, we're looking at either January, um, hopefully, of next year or um, July next year at the latest. Okay, thanks. There's a hand in the back. Hi, my name is Lisa Burns. I'm District 1, Montpelier. Um, I was going to ask this later, but I think since we're on the topic, now's a good time. I wonder if there's any database or um, if anyone can give any information about the cost of our water main breaks to people um, either in their homes by high pressures going through or businesses that have to close. Um, is there any information on the financial impact to those of us who pay the water and sewer bills in the city? Thank you. <clears throat> so that's really more relevant to the next discussion about um, the pressures, issues within the system. Um, Dufresne Group, our consultant, um, has sort of tried to quantify that. It's really um, subjective. It's hard to put um, an actual dollar value to those impacts. Um, because it varies so much. But you um, will be covering that. But yes, I'll let I'll let Dufresne Group talk about that um, when, uh, on the next presentation. Okay. I don't see any other hand. Oh, yes, Mr. Muller again. This will be frequent. Um, well, Scott Muller, Montpelier. Um, you our, mentioned our about general practice is speaking once on a topic. So I'll we'll try to. Thank you. Uh, it's for the common good. Um, so the point here is you're asking about metrics for systems compared to other systems. Yes, the American Water Works Association, all the cities talk about this, all the countries talk about this, the cost of the system, the cost of water. It's more important than oil. It's more expensive than oil. This is a very well studied subject. You do have data and it's pressure in the system. 50% is over 200 PSI. That's unheard of. No cities in the world run their water systems at that. Nobody. It's an extreme outlier. That's why the pipes are breaking. Okay. Anyone else on the council have any questions? Or um, I appreciate all the charts and you going over it, both of you. I really thank you. Is there is there a motion? The the topic here is to approve the uh, the budget. Is there a motion to approve the budget? I move we approve the budget as proposed by the I'll second it. Any discussion? So what would it may I? So what would it what would it take to, to change the method that, that we use, the, the CPI method, for example? I mean just, ultimately just you'd be, so we're not gonna do it tonight, but what would it take? A vote of the council. It's mm -hmm. a policy decision of the council. Mm -hmm. uh, so presumably you'd look at information and, and come up with a different system. Up with a system that you feel you're more comfortable with. And I think one of that was one of the, the basis for the rate study was to yeah. not only because, you know, you can also look at how, you know, at, we have a system that the more you use, the more uh, you get charged. So the idea is, is to, to um, incentivize conservation of, of water. So, you know, the, all those different kind of factors can be looked at as parts of rate study and how that works and big customers. And for example, the allocation fee that Kurt mentioned that we don't charge was a, a policy decision by the city council to try to um, encourage more development. So that it was one less cost that somebody had to incur to do a, a project in Montpelier that they have to do in other communities to try to offset rate cuts and those kind of things. So, you know, all of that is something that you look at and then you can make a decision. Um, you know, like I said, this, we've just, we've, I'm not going to say just, cause obviously we're responsible people, but we've followed this, the council policy for several years based on that. And, and I think Tim's right that, you know, for several years, it wasn't a, a large increase. It's the last two years of, you know, inflation has been significantly different. And I think Don is right that we had, uh, there had been many years we had no rate change, and then would find that we were 
you know, behind, and then it would be a 15% or something like that to try to catch up. And so the council said, Hey, let's just, let's make it a policy that will go up by the cost of living and then add a percent for the capital improvements. And that's been the adopted policy. We followed it. If and it takes you folks to change it. Um, just one other thing. Is there a, um, I, I haven't seen the actual budget. Is there a, we have the unrestricted fund, which can be used for, um, to re make repairs, I, I assume, un unanticipated repairs. Is there a line item also for that? In other words, is the unrestricted fund actually in excess of what we have historically needed? And do we ever use it to reduce rates or to, um, or to pay the inflated prices that contractors want to charge us to fix our pipes? <laughs> Um, so there is a line item for um, other purchase services in the budget for water line repairs. Um, as far as um, we haven't, uh, you know, historically we haven't had a, a large fund balance in, in these um, funds. So that's a relatively new occurrence. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a lot of history with it. Um, you know, I think, I think like uh, Sarah mentioned, primarily we're, we'd like to maintain some contingency within the fund because unexpected things happen. Um, that you can't predict whether it's um, like the school street line that really failed rather quickly um, or something at a treatment plant, a piece of equipment, expensive piece of equipment that really has to be replaced in order to maintain um, operations. Um, I think it's wise to maintain some contingency level within the fund. Um, yeah. And I, I noticed that it, it hasn't been, there hasn't been much excess uh, up until the last um, couple of years, 2021. 20, um, was that partly because we budgeted more than we were able to spend because of uh, COVID uh, staffing shortages? Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with um, so a lot of the grant money the city's gotten. Um, we've gotten a lot of ARPA grants for um, like the State Street Project um, that we weren't really anticipating. Um, so I would say it's more related to that than staff capacity as far as outside funding. But no. Um, you know, the, the staff capacity issue is, is more of an issue for us now than it was um, the last couple of years. Okay. And also at a historic, um, wasn't that long ago that we were having conversations about the deficits in both of those funds. And so we were on a pretty active deficit reduction plan, which also held expenses down, but also we were trying to raise that. I think that's also part of where the inflation rate came from to get these. So as Kurt mentioned, we haven't been talking about surplus situations um, for a long time until the last couple of years, we finally caught up uh, maybe two or three years ago. So uh, it, it is due. But to, to your question, Council Member Alfano, you could, I mean, can use surpluses to reduce rates if you choose. You could use it to, um, for as, as Kurt mentioned, unexpected um, expenses. You can use it for, you know, as I said, we, we have as cost estimates for projects, but what we're seeing is uh, across the board, whether it's water, sewer, uh, really any of our projects, we have what are good cost estimates, estimates and it's still coming at 20, 25% higher. Uh, so we can budget a certain amount if we, we can either use the surplus to do the work we had planned, or we've got to reduce the amount of work that we do within the budget. So, I mean, it's always, you know, it's always what's, I think this is one of the great policy questions uh, out, of, out of any government is if you have extra money, you know, sort of what's the best use to you use it to reduce your rates, or do you have are you better protecting the public by having a contingency plan for an emergency? I think they're all good answers. It's really how you decide to win. Palin. Um, thank you for your presentation and hard work. I just want to ask um, if there are any ways to produce uh, alternative budgets. I'm not an engineer, so I don't know all the details, but on my day to day job, when I propose a budget for my department at the college, I produce alternative ones, like all the things we are told, oh, if you use this system, then it will uh, affect the budget that much and we will have lesser budget. Or if you use this, it will affect the budget and we will have higher budgets. So it is, um, for me, a little bit challenging to decide because we have only one budget. Right, I don't know the alternatives. So if I say yes, I don't know 
what are other alternatives or if I say no again, same thing. So has it been done like all the time, like one budget because all the, uh, you know, water system or can we do it like alternative budgets and we can use the most uh, reasonable and feasible one and will help residents uh, to pay um, their bills? Thank you. So from, from a process perspective, I can tell you that um, given those, the rate policy of the council. And, and so, you know, we start with that. So that has essentially, we've estimated the revenue available through that rate policy and then made a budget to fit that. So, mm -hmm. there, you know, there would be more things that we would include if there were unlimited funds. Um, and then um, in part because uses is Time they're doing the budget and then cut another couple percent out of it to fit it in with this, but seeing offsetting revenues because we again, like others have said, we didn't think that was fair to mm -hmm. to put on the residents. Um, and otherwise, I think in in water and sewer, you know, there's I mean, obviously, I think there's always things you can change, but it's pretty it's a set number of employees to fix the, the water and sewer lines and, and do the maintenance and that kind of thing. The employees to run the plants. Uh, and and the chemicals and operating costs of the plants, uh, and then I mean, really trying to emphasize the improvement, mm -hmm. the, the line improvements, make sure there's sufficient capital funding there to deal with that, and to deal with leaks and other things. So there's, you know, I think it becomes a question of what service area do we want to do less of? Um, do we want to be less responsive to, to line maintenance? Do we want to do less projects? Do we want to somehow shortchange our plants? And you know. Could we trim around the edges? Probably, but um, you know, really, I think we're just trying to deliver. Someone said it: the water is the most important thing, right? It's the most fundamental thing. So, uh, having safe, clean drinking water and reliable is really important. So, can I assume that this is the most conservative budget we can receive to vote on? I mean, <laughs> I know it is hard, but just no, trying I mean, I to think... ask this question sure. for everyone. I mean, I think... You know, I, if you remember that, that you know, I think it's uh, if, if the council wanted to see a lower budget, we could provide it, then you could make a decision whether that was sufficient. I mean, we can always do that with anything. I just, you know, there are impacts. And as I said, you know, we, and again, not to simplify it, but we, we, we presented, this is, we think, the best combination of budget within the current rate policy. Um, and so if you were to change how you wanted to do rates, then we, we could look at that. Um, but I don't know what we did figure out what would happen if there was no rates, how much we'd have to cut is that we had that number. So if we held the rates even. If we held the rates even, we would have to reduce the water budget by $191,000 and the sewer budget by $160,000. And what would that result in, in terms of operations? I mean, I think it would, it would come down to the capital project. So um, in the water fund, for example, we have, um, I think, 150000 to complete um, the service line transfers to eliminate the second water main on School Street. So it would come down to projects because you don't, you know, you can't cut chemical costs or usage or anything like that, the plants or staff. So You know, you could conceivably in the sewers and, you know, take that out of the reserve, the $900,000 mm -hmm. reserve. Yeah. Um, just I, I I just got word that the the folks out in Zoomland are not getting anything. Um, okay. It's not. I, I see that the screen yeah. is not matching what's on our screen. So. Okay. Let's pause while we work on that. Okay. <laughs> I'm told that we are. Uh, back in business with uh, Zoom connectivity, so we could uh, cease conversation in the room. Um, uh, Carrie, did you have another thing to say? Okay, uh, Donna and then Sal. I don't think there's a surplus. I wouldn't use that word because I feel that our infrastructure and water and sewage, we could always do more. And hence, I feel it's important that we shift whatever money we haven't spent in a given year, that we hold a steady state. I mean, I was on council when National Life went to, that's water usage toilets. 
And it was very, very significant. We want to conserve water, but guess what? The infrastructure for water and sewage stays the same. So we had less water that we were getting paid for. So everybody was paying more. One of the reasons we went after and sought Bar Hill was they use our water. So we come back to the fact that we have an infrastructure and a federal standards for our water, sewage, and we're going to find out more about stormwater that we want to follow and have been following, and hence it cost. And our infrastructure is not caught up with all those new standards. They're getting there, but they're not caught up. So I feel like, one, we de definitely need to have a bigger population. Again, back to that 10,000 people that our infrastructure could support. So we're all paying less. But I don't feel this is the time to get cheap on our water and infrastructure. And that uh, you can say that maybe the CPI is not the way to go, but we need something besides just what it cost in one year. We need to plan ahead. We need to have a steady approach. And because the staff has been so good getting grants, we have some money that we could put in something we didn't expect to be able to do. So I come from a whole different level of looking at the water and sewage rate. We even have a committee that looks at this. I believe some council members on it. Uh, I'm not on that committee, but I really respect when they come back with a water rate that they really explored it. But that's where I'm at. I don't think it's unreasonable and I would vote to support this rate proposed. So um, I actually uh, agree with, with all of that. I, I don't see an advantage in, in in cutting the budget budget what I, what i would like to see though is i mean we lost time on our schedule it seems to me during the pandemic we lost a couple of years we lost people we lost we've lost um an opportunity to we, we've lost our place in the schedule essentially and and if we if we have an excess, I, I think we ought to not just hold steady at the moment. I think we need a plan to catch up. I know it's hard because you're you're down, you're down people, and you're in a very competitive environment. But um, I don't think we can afford to lose two years replacing pipes because we're ending up, you know, doing a lot of repairs that we're not expecting. I, you know this better than anyone. Um, so I, I guess I. Uh, I'm I'm in support of the budget, but I'm also in support of of more than a steady state for the next whatever it takes couple of years that we do what you know we 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 brainstorm and find a way to do more than than we think we're able to do, whether it's using subcontractors more or I, I mean I don't know the answer. I just think we need to catch up or we're we're going to be forever behind so uh, thank you i uh, just for probably for your benefit but also everyone else is listening um we did we did lose some work but as you saw we're still ahead of the, the targets that we established and just to be clear we did put five hundred thousand. the council put five hundred thousand dollars for water and sewer improvements of arpa money into the system out of the two million we got so 25 percent of the money we got was put toward water and then another but batch was part of uh we did fund the delayed the projects that have been delayed projects and equipment have been delayed to a tune of about 1.2 million those were included roads and other not just water and sewer but so you know about 1.7 million of the now well, i'm probably rounding one about 1.5 million of the two went to those kinds of infrastructure to to try to make up for the lost time so it wasn't it wasn't to all totally lost money but um one question and this isn't isn't really a question for this year's budget but uh i know that part of the discussion for uh the last couple of years has been uh where are we going to become able to come up with more money to replace the capital system and we've talked about the uh retiring the bonds for the uh for the water plant and i wonder if we could Mention that a little bit. And that will fall off um, and that will allow for another $290,000 um, annually to be towards capital, whether that be debt related capital or other straight capital improvements. 
Okay. Um, any other discussion before we uh, are ready to vote on the motion? Okay. The motion is to approve the uh, budget as proposed. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Rates separately, or did that include the rates? That that motion did not include the rates. So now we're up to uh, water and sewer rates. And again, take it away. Oh. Presentation, just <laughs> approve the rates, please. Uh -huh. Okay. I move we approve the water sewer rates as presented by staff. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Well, guess Kurt, you don't get to go anywhere. <laughs> Where? Next. Thanks, Sarah. Next up, we have water and sewer infrastructure plan. So while they're getting set up, I think our plan was to um, hear from our consultant outlaying their work and then hear comments from the state. Uh, and I know we've recently replied back to the state. I don't know if they've had a chance to process that yet, but we're looking forward to hearing their comments and then um, obviously take public comments and then have a discussion. Okay. All right. Um, Kurt Monaco. <laughs> Interesting, it's not on the screen. All right. Uh, so again, I'm Kurt Monica, Public Works Director, and with me tonight is Stan Welch, Project Manager for Dufresne Group. That's a consultant that has developed our um, hydraulic model and our preliminary engineering report uh, on the water distribution system. Um, so just a, a little background on um, you know, how we uh, got here into this project. Um, the city of Montpelier has issued a, a permit to operate for our water system. Um, the most recent permit was issued on January 7th, 2022. And uh, as part of that permit, um, we were asked to evaluate high pressure transient events and strategies um, for remediating uh, locally elevated pressures um, within the system. And that uh, permit is issued by the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division. We do have uh, two representatives here tonight for um, to help answer questions. Uh, this meeting is also intended to be an opportunity for public comment. And so the um, the uh, Dufresne group has prepared a 90% draft um, report, um, which addresses um, those items in the permit to operate that I mentioned, as well as uh, identifying uh, areas in the distribution system where um, the hydrants are on undersized lines that can result in pressure issues within the system. Um, <clears throat> So that 90% was uh, draft report was submitted to the state of Vermont. They uh, provided comment back um, and asked for some additional um, analysis to be uh, evaluated, alternatives to be evaluated. Um, Dufresne Group has um, provided written responses to those uh, comments, but they have not finalized the preliminary engineering report to incorporate those responses or the state comments. Um, so that's just kind of uh, uh, where we're at, and I will turn it over to Stan to sort of talk about the report and what uh, was what went into it. 
All right. As Kurt said, I'm Stan Welch. I'm from Dufresne Group, one of the project managers and co-authors of the report. Um, as Kurt mentioned, is at 90% stage, this is a, a really good opportunity to get public feedback. It seems like there is um, quite a few people who want to speak, which is which is great. We we want to hear that feedback. Um, to kind of echo what Kurt said, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do a crash course of kind of the status of the system now and some of the alternatives we considered. Review the report and touch on um, the financials, uh, at least preliminary cost estimates associated with the consideration of a few of these alternatives. Um, but the permit to operate included the special condition to evaluate in general the, the pressures, elevated pressure conditions, what's viewed as generally high pressure and high pressure transient events throughout the system. It also includes two violations that are listed, which are associated with the inability to provide 500 gallons a minute at all hydrants while maintaining 20 PSI throughout the system. Um, so this, our report tries to address the special condition as well as the violations. Uh, see if I can, there we go. So this is figure two one from the report. This is just generally an overview of your water system right now. I don't know how easy that is to see for everybody in terms of color, but you basically have the large blue areas, your main pressure zone, which is supported from pumps at the water treatment facility. You have this uh, pink area up here, which is your downhill pressure zone, which is a separate pump station and tank that supports that area. You have the terrace street pressure zone, which is sort of the same situation. You have a pump station and a tank, and then you have a small uh, hydropneumatic booster station serving the highest elevation homes in Murray Hill. And kind of attached uh, on their own system is the CVMC water system, which is also pumped from the treatment plant to their own storage tank. Um, Average day demand of the plant is about 960,000 gallons per day. On average, that's what the plant produces and sends to the distribution system. It's about 56 miles of distribution and transmission main throughout the city um, in terms of linear footage of pipe. There's roughly 3,015 metered connections on the water system, um, 233 in the Town Hill zone and 168 in the Terrace Street zone. So it's about 400 and including the 12 on the Murray Hill zone in their own boosted zone, your mid 400s and uh, you know low 400s rather in terms of uh, connections and dedicated pressure zones. Uh, there's approximately 2,800 customers that have service pressures in excess of 80 PSI. Um, that 80 PSI number is significant uh, because that is the threshold for the international plumbing code where the pressure needs to be reduced within the building. Um, so that's everybody who has a local PRV, a PRV in their basement, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Um, that 80 PSI is the, is the plumbing code threshold. Um, the fire flow established for the system, the minimum fire flow criteria is the water supply minimum criteria, which is 500 gallons per minute for two hours, we'll maintain 20 PSI in the system. So that's what we use as our basis of fire flow when we were evaluating these alternatives. Um, and we, to get started on this, we did a round of calibration testing. We did fire flow testing throughout the city and monitored pressures along with reviewing the SCADA data for pressures that the city monitors on a regular basis, which are pressures at the Town Hill pump station, Terra Street pump station, the water treatment plant, and right here at City Hall. Um, so we had pretty good data sets. In addition to that, we put pressure recorders out for seven days at three different spots throughout the city and logged that data as well. Um, this, I think Scott kind of touched on this earlier um, with his comment. This is the breakdown of pressure using 150 PSI as the, as the threshold throughout the system. So the blue areas are areas where service pressure is below 150 PSI, and the red areas are areas where the service pressure is above 150 PSI. And that breaks down to approximately 51% of the system is has pressures delivered at above 150 PSI. Um, the 200 PSI number was thrown around earlier. That's the maximum pressure in the system. And there are about 175 connections that are between 190 and 200 PSI that are served currently by the system. Is, is there a way to tell like where those are? Do those tend to be like really low parts of the city? Yeah, it's all based on static elevations. So that's your lowest elevation within your main pressure zone. So that's there's a, about 175 connections that are in your downtown area. So you can you can kind of see based on elevation, it's it's really the river and the low points. You know, you've got 
uh, west of the city on Route 2, east of the city on Route 2, 302, and then north on Elm Street. Thanks. Sure. Um, so to get started, um, we really took the approach. We understand that pressure is kind of the, the central cog here. That's what people want to hear about. That's what we want to talk about is looking at what could we do to manage our pressures with that special condition of the permit to operate being addressing high pressure transient events or generally elevated pressures that are routinely present in the system. So we calibrated our model and took an iter iterative approach to looking at basically what's the best bang for the buck? How much pressure can we, what's the most amount of pressure we can pull out of the system and maintain a reasonable level of capital investment? And through a few different processes, we basically came up with anywhere between 20 and the 88 pounds where we landed is roughly the same amount of capital investment in terms of order of magnitude. So the alternative that we flushed out in the report is pulling as the most amount of pressure as we could while maintaining that order of magnitude level of investment. If we go beyond the, the 88 PSI reduction that we're looking at, the issues become a lot more widespread. And so this figure 4-1 kind of represents the issues when you pull out the 88 PSI from the central pressure zone and roughly 80 PSI from this 302 and Gallison Hill Spur. These are where your issues develop in a average day condition. So this is not a fire flow condition. This is just areas of the system that become deficient for the water supply rule with normal pressures. So you have this uh, Northfield Street area, this upper end of Main Street, Emmons Street College Street, um, the upper end of North. North Street, I believe, some of the higher elevation areas near Terra Street. Um, and then these are, this is Hubbard Park and this is the top of, it's Core Street, correct? Core Street. There are some, some kind of centrally elevated positions or services there that also go deficient. So when we flushed out the alternative two that's considered in the report, we were looking at the level of investment to address these pressure deficiencies that develop when we reduce the pressure. Sam, those are deficient um, for the for the hydrants or? No, that's normal, that's service normal pressure. Normal so Yeah, that's um, issues that, or services that fall below 35 PSI under normal average day conditions, which is the minimum criteria. 35 PSI under average day, under normal conditions for the water supply rule and 20 PSI under a high flow event. And what's the impact of the, homeowner in it in one of these places if the uh if it's uh, insufficient pressure oh and that would become a violation of the water supply rule so that would end up on your permit to operate to address and you would have to come up with a strategy to boost pressure or address that deficiency one way or another which is basically what we've what we flushed out with our alternative is okay we've reduced the pressure we've developed these other areas that are now deficiencies what do we need to invest to address those deficiencies and maintain our system you know, continue to serve our our um, user base. And that's what this figure 412 uh, represents. We, um, we looked at a, a few different alternatives, sorry, a few different alternatives that are considered in the report to address each of these. Um, but basically, we developed two additional pressure zones, the reduced uh, main pressure zone and this Gallison Hill pressure zone. Um, and to address those deficiencies that developed at the top of Main Street, we have to relocate the Easy Street pump station, which now serves the Town Hill zone. That's what gets the water into the tank. When we reduce the pressure 88 pounds, that pump station can no longer operate. So it needs to be re relocated where it has adequate suction pressure. So we move it down the hill or build a new pump station rather down the hill along Main Street and then extend this pressure zone further down the hill to address those deficiencies that developed at the top end of Main Street. To address the um, National Life Area Northfield Street, we looked at a dedicated water main that would bypass the, the reduced pressure and would basically reconnect that area of the system back to the normal pressure zone that is now the main pressure zone. So the Northfield Street National Life Area would be returned to, stat returned to its current status in terms of pressure. Um, the Terrace Street area, the pumps would need to be replaced and the programming redone. And then those high elevation areas in the Terrace Street zone could be pretty easily connected to the zone. There's not a huge amount of cost in terms of infrastructure to get them transitioned into that zone. Um, and then locally, um, the developed uh, high pressures on like Hubbard Park, the top of Core Street and North Street, 
those um, were not sufficient in number for us to contemplate significant capital investment in terms of uh, big booster stations, new tanks. So we carried costs to develop or to address those on a more individual level, maybe a smaller hydropneumatic pump station to serve the North Street homes or disconnection of some of the higher elevation places and exploring drilling wells. That would be feasible. So um, there are some, you know, this, this would get everybody down to the highest pressure in the zone would be 112 PSI, which is now the, the 200 PSI. So you are looking at an 88 pound reduction. Um, there are some other drawbacks that when you reduce this pressure zone that significantly, the um, infrastructure basically needs to be built out and developed before that pressure reduction can take place. There really is no great way to phase this, what could happen in chunks. So from a capital investment standpoint and an implementation standpoint, this all needs to be planned. The land needs to be acquired. Everything needs to be permitted, infrastructure constructed, permitted, designed, constructed before the reduction could take place. So the implementation schedule is, is extended. Um, um, this doesn't address necessarily, I know that everybody's associating pressure with breaks, which there's definitely a correlation intuitively. I think everybody understands that, but it, it is important to note that breaks don't go away with a reduction in pressure. There are a lot of other considerations, primarily in this system, age of the mains is, is huge. There's roughly 46% of the distribution system is either beyond its expected useful life in terms of age or is expected to exceed its useful life in the next 20 years. So a huge chunk, almost half of the distribution network that, that really needs to be replaced based on an age condition. Um, that was kind of backed up by our fire flow testing. We saw um, friction values that, that would make sense associated with, with those ages. So that investment, that 46% replacement is still still there. The reduction in pressure doesn't mitigate the need to have to invest in the distribution system. Um, there are fire flow implications, which I will will touch on. I've got another figure in here, which talks about the reduction in firefighting capacity and fire protection. Um, that, that's a significant issue. Additionally, anybody who has a sprinkler system, whether it's a commercial industrial building or a residence, um, if you adjust their pressure, that system would need to be reevaluated, redesigned, possibly reconstructed. Um, so that's, that's something to consider as well. Um, this alternative of reducing pressure flushes out the special condition of the permit, but this alone without investment in the distribution system does not address the violations in the permit to operate, which were associated with the 500 gallons per minute, 20 PSI flow. Uh, in comparison to this, we reviewed alternative three, which I, I don't have a figure for, but alternative three in short is replacing the distribution system through phased capital investment planning with adequately sized mains and proper construction methods and um, different materials. I know that the city has transitioned more to HDPE as kind of a primary water main material. One of the benefits of HDPE or PVC plastic pipe in general is that it's, it's flexible in comparison to ductile iron or cast iron. And so when you're considering um, transient events, water hammer or surges, that pipe will actually buffer that surge because it will expand and contract. And that, that is significant. Um, the other aspect is velocity in the pipe. So if you have undersized mains that you're trying to get fire flow through, upsizing those mains to be more adequately sized significantly reduces the velocity, which also um, improves the, or would reduce the impacts of surge or water hammer that would be felt. Um, and we kind of, we didn't necessarily flush that out so well in this 90% draft. Our comment responses really touch on that back to the state and kind of review the hydraulics. In addition, um, any sort of low pressures, if people have experienced low pressures during um, firefighting events or flushing, that also goes away with improvements to the distribution system. So right now that's all associated with flow and the condition of the pipe. So without improving the condition of the pipe or reducing the velocity in the pipe through upsizing the pipe, you still get significant pressure reductions with any sort of fire flow. So high flow events, you still see big pressure fluctuations. Um, I think it is important to note, and I think 
I would be interested to get feedback from the public, which I think we will, but our data recorders and SCADA data and chart recorders that we put out, we didn't know any operational transient events. Um, that's associated with a sudden change in demand, a rapid change in velocity within the pipe. We didn't have anything that picked up anything that we could, we could tie to normal operation of the water system, including our um, calibration testing, which was fire flow testing or flushing. We didn't see any significant spikes that were de developed from that. We did see significant reductions in pressure, which were friction related, but we didn't see spikes develop because of a rapid change in velocity. Um, I think that that phenomenon is probably experienced with, with water main breaks. If, if a water main is disturbed and breaks rapidly, that's a rapid change in velocity. So if there are areas that are experiencing significant amounts of breaks that may be occurring there, um, locally, and if it, it just didn't overlap with our chart recorders, we didn't see it, but we also didn't see it in the SCADA data, which which goes back pretty far. So um, if there's more data out there or available, we would be happy to continue to process that. Um, I touched on this in comparison to the alternatives. This is a figure basically illustrating graphically where your fire flow violations are. These are the actual violations for the permit to operate. There are areas in the system where hydrants cannot provide 500 gallons per minute without reducing distribution systems or distribution system pressure below 20 PSI. So technically, per your permit, these hydrants need to be made unavailable for, to the fire department. When you consider this in comparison, so this is current pressure situation, and this is if you reduce the pressure 88 pounds, you develop a significant amount of additional hydrants that would become deficiencies. So overlaying this with the hydrant locations, it's roughly 32 hydrants. Um, you've got some areas that are really grouped this northern end of Elm Street, this area east of the town, and uh, National Life Building. And I think it's uh, Meadowview, I believe. Is that the right street? Mountain, Mountain View. View, sorry, Mountain View. This, this is Mountain View Street, National Life in here. Um, this is Wesnell Drive and that neighborhood out there. Additionally, there's some hydrants scattered throughout downtown. This is the, the Heaton Woods residence is up here. Um, Shaw's is in here. So there's a couple of hydrants on Barry Street, as well as the hydrant at the dead end of Barry Street that basically would need to be made unavailable. So this is one of those things that it was touched on when you talked about the budget is um, damages, reductions in pressure or um, costs associated with firefighting, you know, the unavailability of hydrant, those are tough to nail down in terms of an economic comparison. That's something that we we definitely want to try to do. We're going to try and work with the state on on coming to terms on metrics and agreeing on, you know, water losses was another thing that came up. You just you reduce the pressure. If you have leakage, that is an actual reduction in water that you're producing. And there is a real cost associated with that. So we do want to flush those out a little bit further. Um, this is the life cycle cost that was included in the report. Um, the big takeaway is it's, it's a significant capital investment to reduce the pressure. Um, it adds o &M. There is opportunity for additional revenue, primarily through connecting the Town Hill Zone to Gallison Hill. There are some residences up there that could be connected to the system. Um, this is all maintenance associated with new infrastructure. And then down here, this uh, distribution system main replacements basically means that you, you can't reduce pressure and the, also eliminate the need to replace your distribution system assets. Those assets still age out, still fail, still need to be replaced. So it's basically an addition of those two costs, whereas alternative three is looking at proper design and hydraulic of water main materials to more effectively convey fire flows and design flows and demands um, with pipe materials that aren't necessarily or are resistant to corrosion, which is an issue that's developed in the city, corrosive soils eating away at pipes. Um, also, we explored the use of flexible pipe materials, which as I mentioned before, will significantly buffer any transient events if there are transient events that are developing the system. Uh, this last table is Appendix G in the report. This is current system, current fire flow deficiencies, and recommendations to address those deficiencies. So this is the construction that needs to happen to get those hydrants that need to be taken offline now back in service, um, and the associated estimated construction costs with those recommendations. 
we reviewed these along with some priority projects with the city and that was ultimately what was presented as the recommended project and the 90 percent draft of the report is um, addressing the highest priority fire flow projects to consider the violations of the permit to operate as well as some of the areas in the city that have experienced high levels of breaks or are aged or undersized that's everything I have for presentation materials, presentation slides. I'm happy to try and answer questions as best I can. Okay, thank you. I know there are a lot of people who want to be heard on that. We'll start with members of the council, if you have any. Oh, you want to hear from this? Why don't we hear from the state before we, and then we will uh, be ready to take our break. Yes. Installing them, right? Yeah, skip that. Yeah, direct question. Uh, well, okay, that's surprising. But <laughs> why don't you come on up and just <laughs> come, come on down? You can sit too. It is a mic. Hi. Uh, my name is Dan and Aggie. I am with the state of Vermont. I am the operations section supervisor for the drinking water program. I signed uh, the permit for for the city. Uh, I guess my concern is we're we're still we don't have a final product here, so we don't have we don't have a final product. So if you have direct questions that you'd like us to talk about, that we'd be happy to do that. But without a final product. Um, I'm not sure. I guess I'm not. I, I don't understand what you might want us to to speak on without a direct question. So fair enough. All right. All right. Thanks, Donna. No, you may get some. <laughs> you may get questions anyway. <laughs> Go ahead, Donna. So my understanding, you came back with a lot of questions. You were not satisfied with the initial response, mm -hmm. and, and my understanding was that initial response came from an uh, an RFP. Or I mean, or some such thing. Okay. I knew they had different initials. Sixty percent. A bid, a bid no, for it, services, a scope of work. Did you not no. approve the scope of work? I thought you saw that. Scope so of work. the PER is a preliminary engineering report. Is what we asked for them to do uh, a the hydraulic analysis, a PER, um, and what we commented on was a sixty percent completion of that document. Right. So they came in with the 60 percent. We this is a normal process in, in in with a permanent engineering report. They came in with a document. We we uh, as a as a program, we evaluated the we had our engineers. I'm not an engineer, by the way. I do have an engineer here. I'm not going to answer technical questions. She will. Uh, and we reviewed that. And then this is a, in a normal. This is. This is what normally happens in the in these situations. We had questions. We sent questions back to her and and to into their engineers. And um and it's it's a, it's sort of a back and forth. It, so we we have we come to a sort of an agreement, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Um so we have a as as they alluded to, mm -hmm. there's a nine, this is sort of a 90% meeting, and then we're gonna have far, further discussions and further um what would you say, Kurt? We're, we're, we're going to have further discussions to come up with something that works for the state and and, and that works for the city. Um, and that aligns with the, the water supply, our water supply. Well, I can't tell you how valuable your statements are. This is typical. This is a back and forth interface right, with getting process, what you process. want. Thank right. you. Because as you know, things hit the paper, right. and then they hit social media, and suddenly it looked like the state was very unhappy with what Montpelier was doing. So thank you. That's what I need to right. clarify. It, it, it's something that it's, it, I guess it's not usually uh, debated in the public, in the public setting. This is, a, is a, this is a larger question um, about a level of service that the city wants and the city and the, and the, and the residents want from their water system. So I think that's where it's getting to be uh, in the in the public field a little more, so. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Lauren. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's 
you or the here. I guess just trying to look for like what is the crux as we're trying to assess what's being presented to us. The public's trying to sift through a lot of technical <laughs> information, like as much in lay terms as possible. Like what is missing from what is being proposed to us that you would like to see or that you're continuing to work through? What are the issues that are raising flags that you're continuing in the normal course of process um, to just you know resolve? Mm -hmm. uh, I like. What option? That's question. <laughs> Allison Murphy, division engineer um, for the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division. Most of the questions that I and comments that I put forward were trying to get to some of the, the logic that happened in the middle. There was data presented and a recommendation. And I think it's really easy when you're down in the weeds to not uh, realize that you may have not provided some context or some uh, connecting thought process that happened. And so a lot of my comments were about, was this thought about? It seems like maybe it was, but it wasn't talked about. Um, so that's, and that's a, like Dana said, it's a normal process um, because you have city staff and engineers that are really in the weeds and then they send it to me. And I'm not as much in the weeds, so I ask for that connecting information and a real drive for transparency on how the decisions are being made. And that way I can say, yes, this meets the standards, the state regulations, the federal regulations. And then it, you know, moves into Dana's department and yours or your field. So I have a question for either one of you, and you certainly can decline to answer it if you if you wish. Um, but as this process is going through, would you characterize that we are to get the state and city are working toward? I mean, that there is a solution that could be reached, or is this is there some gap that can't be crossed, or something in between there? I don't know if I'm said that the right way, but. I don't think there's an. We're not at an impasse. That's for sure. There's definitely there's ground for um for a solution and i think we're we're working towards that and that's kind of and that's where my hesitation is to start talking about something that's not finalized and then and kind of muddying the waters that way no i i appreciate that and yep. I, I wasn't trying to set you up i just know nope. as, as donna mentioned you know when things hit the paper it comes off as though there's you know sort of competing sides or you know there's, some, a, there's a conflict of... and and i have not this is the first time ever met right. you folks i haven't been involved in this at all mm -hmm. so i'm just curious what uh there's been a lot of characterize the progress that's being made yeah there's been a lot of uh there's been a lot of public input there's been a lot of public concern so it, it kind of it heightens things okay. so thank you yep you're welcome Anybody else while I'm up here? Lauren. All right. And I, I guess just following up on that. So, I mean, we've heard even tonight from, from members of the public, like the, the water pressure we have is just unbelievable internationally, even. And like, so what I'm hearing, at least the sense is, well, we're still working out the detail. Like the plan that we're being presented is headed in the direction of addressing it in a way that the state ultimately I mean, not to prejudge but like we're we're addressing the issues in a way that you you know we're going to get to a resolution that the state's going to be comfortable with and like we're not way out base which is the way certainly the newspaper has conveyed it as like we're way out of whack somehow or is that unfair and it's too early to say that i'd say we have alternatives to 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 look at further and I believe there is a there's a path forward. I think we're going to come to we're, there's a solution here, and we're going to get to it. I guess is have a friend who's on very city council and was told that they also have high water pressure and they also have old pipes like Montpelier. So for cities that have infrastructure underground as old as ours, are we that out of whack with problems with our leakage and breakage um try allison murphy again um so the frequency and number of breaks in the past few years have been higher than what i am familiar with um for it but you are not alone in having high pressures 
that's about as clear as I can do without querying databases. One other point is there have been a handful of system-wide failures in the state in the past years, and two of them have happened here in Montpelier. So something to think about. If that's all the questions people have of the state people right now, I think this is a, a good time for us to take our uh, our break since we are. Yes, there, is there anyone in the public who wants to ask questions directed to the state? Uh, we've, we've got a couple, uh, Steve, Dan, Chris, Stan, okay. Stephen MacArthur from Montpelier, and uh, I've been following the water issue for a while since uh, uh, probably a couple of two, three years now, and I, I've learned some things in the past uh, six to 12 months that, and I apologize to, to Donna for, for, for being uh, a... a um, <clears throat> Uh, burr in, in the saddle, so to speak. Uh, I, I know that there are a lot of people who have been concerned about it and have spoken up and have written things in social media and have written things in the newspaper and have written things on Front Porch Forum because those are the places that we are able to speak publicly about those concerns. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I apologize if that has bothered you. Um, I'm curious to know whether in any of these conversations, uh, any of the folks involved, the state, Dufresne, uh, and, and even Kurt, looking at uh, the city's current 50-year plan, the so-called 50-year plan for our water system was evaluated, whether that was taken into consideration in the preliminary engineering report in answers to the state, and whether the state has seen that plan uh, in terms of its being able to respond to the preliminary engineering report. Now, as far as I'm concerned, having read the 52 items that the state responded to the to the city on, uh, it it was uh, it was critical. It was it wasn't as if it was oh la di da everything's fine let's just go ahead and fix all of this. It was it was critical. It had some very serious criticisms and demands of the city. And I don't think it's uh, just a matter of sloughing that off. And I'm really interested in what the so-called final preliminary uh, engineering report is going to look like in response to the state and perhaps what it ought to have been in the first place uh, so that we didn't get 52 serious questions about our preliminary plan. That's those are my comments. So I'd like to know if there was any analysis of the 50 year plan that the city has in place, spending money into the 2050s. I don't think we have until the 2050s to fix our water system. I can. Um, we did not review as part of this report the existing capital improvement um, master plan. We did, we referenced it a few times um, and note that the city has a plan to invest in this water system and has put energy and effort into that. But we tried to take a separate approach to really quantifying the level of investment based on age and condition of the distribution system assets. And that's really what you see in that alternative three is that 46% of the distribution system that is either exceeded its useful life or will exceed its useful life in roughly 20 years. So I think that this is a good opportunity to try and take this data and continue to collect data that the city is, is doing a really good job of with GIS and reevaluate some of the capital improvement infrastructure investments and planning. And also as people have touched on, there's opportunity right now with, with funds available through the state and that's really one of the big takeaways from this report is that this report will hopefully serve as the PER that will be the basis of funding applications for some of the short term, the most critical um, infrastructure investment opportunities, which is what's outlined in the last couple 
sections of the report. Um, that investment, uh, the, that short-term window we see as, um, I think it was five-year capital plan that's actually flushed out. The rest of it will be in the appendix with costs, but we see that as an opportunity to continue to collect data, review break histories, review pressure data. If there's areas that are identified as there are transients developed in this area and we can tie them to a specific user or specific flows, and maybe we drill down and look at, at um, more, more localized infrastructure investment and those priorities reshift. So I think as part of any asset management plan and, and maintenance of a distribution system, those, those data and processing collection needs to be happening continuously. Um, as far as the state comments, um, we did address the comments and responded to the comments. We haven't um, finalized the report, and part of that was based on this meeting. We wanted to have the opportunity to review from council and from the public and, and collect any other additional data and then open the door to more dialogue with the state. The biggest piece being quantifying, I mean, the biggest piece in the comments that kept coming up was how are you quantifying costs associated with residential PRVs or water losses or breaks associated specifically with pressure? And how are we quantifying the reduction in firefighting capacity? So those are some things that are not necessarily easy to just quantify. Um, so we're gonna have some back and forth and some dialogue to really flush those out, make sure that we do quantify some costs. I did, I missed a point that I did want to touch on um, in comparison to the alternatives, reducing 88 pounds from the system in the central zone, that number that I talked about, that 80 PSI, you get about an additional 485 customers that fall below that 80 PSI. So that private savings of PRV maintenance, PRV installation is spread across 485 customers. Um, so that's another piece to consider is in terms of investment in physical infrastructure that's required per some sort of code that's like a, you know, a rigid piece of paper that could be referenced that's a, that's a, a regulation, um, that savings is spread across 485 customers with a, with a user base of 3,015. So it's, a, it's tough to make an equitable comparison on, on savings versus costs when you're comparing different user bases. So. Uh, there's a there's a lot that needs to go into looking at the costs and and we're gonna try really hard to to square up with the state, have some back and forth, and make sure we're all on the same plan on what we're carrying for numbers and that it that it makes sense. And that's the biggest thing is we we want the solution that we recommend to be the best fit for the community, and it need it should be data driven, and 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 based in um, fact. And, and so to be clear, for. Uh about what you're talking about if uh, the the total cost of that additional 80 psi uh, uh, reduction would be borne by all the users in the system but the financial benefit would flow to 485 customers is that report just that portion of the financial benefit so if you're looking at this these 485 customers no longer have to own or maintain prv so that just that specific piece but if you're talking about water losses or breaks that are overhead line items in the overall budget that's equitable that's something that's spread across the entire user base but that specific savings and in infrastructure that goes into somebody's home is compared to a capital investment that's that's burdened by the entire user base. Thanks. Um, Dan, I think I've got you next. Hi, all Dan Jones, Montpelier. Um I work more of a candy store uh, mentality, so I'm going to only look at big numbers that kind of step out at me. Um, so it, it seemed to me I saw an 80 million plus number that uh, did the 40, 45% of the uh, infrastructure that needs to be replaced plus the uh, pressure uh, changes. Would that be a correct number for, uh, if, I, if I'm looking at what's I- what's Yeah, I, that alternative two is the present day worth 82 million. Okay, roughly. now, and so uh, I heard in the original report as I read it, that uh, you know, you'd had an option three, which was a much cheaper number, uh, but was, you know, I think the bridge crack quantified it as status quo uh, maintenance. And I was curious because the state uh, comments basically said that was not a viable option, if I, if I understood that correctly. Was that, uh... Yeah, I think I can 
I think I can address that. So that that was um, that comment was specifically viewed through the lens of, like you said, status quo. And I want to be clear that alternative three is considered in the report is not replacing these mains with, you know, it's not replacing four inch mains with hydrants on it with four inch mains with hydrants on it, or six inch mains with hydrants on it with six inch. We're replacing with updated pipe materials and reevaluating sizes. So the the system would be hydraulically designed for the flows that that it should be, including fire flow. So it isn't, it's not like kind replacement, it's not status quo, it's stepping back and looking at what are our demands, what are our fire flow, and let's size these water mains so appropriately. The, the fire flow, uh, specifically, but then the larger uh, issue about uh, the pressure throughout the system, which causes the regular breaks, the uh, geysers on various streets, et cetera, would not be addressed by that system by that th those fixes that that would be something that continued and an increasing cost of the city because as far as i understand it the longer we go on with high pressure on this old system the more damage we're going to see on a yearly basis so because th that's constantly now pounding at the system creating uh increasing damage it's uh, am i wrong in that i don't say that you're holistically wrong i think there are definitely do you have great perspectives. Um, the key here is that I think just because you go from 200 PSI to 112 PSI, 150 PSI, 160, whatever number you pick that's some reduction, if you have a hundred year old cast iron water main, it's it, reducing the pressure isn't going to mean that that doesn't fail, that the break doesn't exist, that the leak doesn't happen. No, but continuing the high pressure is, uh, will increase uh, you know, with the old system, the number and of... Uh... Maybe Kirk can touch on this the areas that you've replaced water main. What are you seeing for break history that with updated materials and sizes? Right. So um, I do have that table, but you know we've done um, we've moved to HTPE probably about five years ago, uh, Clarendon Avenue, um, uh, Northfield Street was PVC. We had a lot of breaks. I don't know if you remember on Northfield Street before we rebuilt it. But essentially, once um, since we've been replacing pipes, the new the streets with new pipes they don't fail anymore. Regardless, you know, at our current pressures. So um, there is a major shift in in break frequency from line replacement. And, and oh, I, I, I'm not doubting that. It, it's it's more the continuation of because you're only limit you know the limit of the area. That's what I was trying to hear. You know, and so it seems like uh, the the more limited option that you were trying to propose, which is in terms of the fire. Uh, thing was uh, a much lower or smaller uh, frame for uh, con uh, reconstruction rather than the uh, the system needs that throughout the, uh, the system, right? No, that, that cost that's carried in that alternative is the cost to replace the 46% of the system that we expect to age out within the next 20 years. That's, so that's the 60 million? Or yeah, the... that's like very significant infrastructure investment in the distribution. Okay, system. well, that's what I was trying. Okay, yeah, thank you. It, it is absolutely not the same thing as doing nothing. It's... Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Chris, Mike, and uh, Tina. Chris Lombra, city employee. I'm currently the facility sustainability coordinator, but previously for about 10 years, I was a city building inspector. And Stan's comment, um, it was already fresh in my mind before it came out of his mouth, is the impact of this pressure reduction on existing fire protection systems in buildings. Um, I think it's significant that the fire protection sprinkler systems in buildings are designed based on the local pressure and local flow that's available to them. And um, the, there are systems in the city that are 100 or more years old that were designed based on the, the pressures, all the systems were based on the pressures that exist now. The majority of the large commercial sprinkler systems, I think maybe maybe Tim would echo this as well, are located in the lower elevations, the downtown areas of the city where the pressure reduction is going to be the greatest. Um, one thing that, that's also crossed my mind, a great number of those, those systems on State Street, Lower State Street, our, our city, our um, state systems in all the state buildings, almost all of the state buildings have fire sprinklers in them. Um, I think upgrading upgrading the sprinklers could be a, a a great expense for for individual building owners. The state state BGS, I think, would be could could very well be 
very impacted by this. And I think the city city has some level of partnership with our with our state owned buildings here. Um, I would encourage engagement with BGS and with the state division of fire safety, specifically around the impact of this pressure reduction on state buildings. Um, National Life is another a huge sprinkler system, three three sprinkler systems up at National Life that also will be impacted. And again, out River Street, that way tractor supply, lots of large sprinkler systems and potential costs. So, so let's not gloss over this, this as a detail and make sure that we really kind of do some due diligence. Thank you. Okay, before I call on anyone else, I know there's a lot of discussion that we have yet to have on this uh on this topic but i think this is an opportunity to give uh people here in the building and at home a chance to interact with our uh domestic water system and take a 10 minute break i chair your Montpelier. first a comment something i know having worked for the state for 32 years that but i often forget is that the state and the city really want the same thing here. Everybody wants the same thing, that, you know, quality, high quality, good water system. Um, as I re said before, you know, I view water as a, a fundamental infrastructure and we have to have it. And as I understood the presentation, it looked to me like other than option three, we were talking Band-Aids. We're talking. We're talking. Putting a, a slapping a bandaid on a on a pretty open wound, um, and I certainly the question that there's a question and a comment. The question is, how long does a bandaid last? Uh, you know, we're we're in a bad situation, and and we're not alone. I know I was just over here in conversation that there are many other communities in the same situation, but um, I I noticed that option three. It looked like to me, caught the the all the money was up front that you we had to we had to do major changes to our to our infrastructure that was, uh, and but in the long run that might save us money, um, and I think that's something that I think I hope you'll consider when when you make any kind of decision like this. Um, I I don't have a lot of hope for our our current water system. I mean, I, it, I just you look at the potholes in the streets you don't look you, you don't have to you don't have to look hard to see that um and i hope you'll think about the idea that let's fix it i mean putting in new pipe that that won't break uh and a a, a flow level that is maintainable and functional um is something that's worthy of our of our investment and it is an investment, a long-term investment. And, and I, you know, I, I don't want to pay more tax than anybody else, but I, I recognize the fact that the costs of getting nickel and dimed uh, for problems, and I, I worry somebody brought up earlier, worry about the costs of our problems. We don't, we don't, we don't, we really don't do a good analysis of the costs of the the weaknesses in our system. And we should have, we pay a lot of taxes and, and we should have a system that works. And I, wor I worry about, you know, people talking about 50 year plans. In 50 years, the technology is gonna be so much different. Uh, and, it, and what we do now will almost seem irrelevant. But I think what we have to do now is look as far down the road as we can and invest in that because if we don't do that we're going to be well i i won't be here forever but i'll be here for a while hopefully um anyway thank you thanks mike uh, tina tina muncie and i live in montpelier and what i'd like now is to know what's the process now so you've explained you're halfway there, then you're 90% there. You're negotiating, you're negotiating. So as a citizen, I want to know how I know what's happening. So thank you for tonight and listening. So now what happens next? 
what's the process? What can I expect to see or hear about before somebody just says it's done or you have a let's vote on it now process? So could you explain to me the process? Don't wrestle each other for the microphone. Yeah, we're all <laughs> looking at each other here. All right. Um, so, all right. So, right now we have a 90% draft plan, and the state has reviewed that plan and provided comments, and our engineer has provided responses to those comments. Um, so, the next step, and now we're going to, and then tonight we also received public comment. Um, so, we're going to take um, all that information and we are going to um, develop a 100% um, complete report. And that will take place through a lot of uh, discussion, um, interaction with the, the state of Vermont Water, Water Supply and uh, Groundwater Protection Division. Um, and then uh, we will come back to council uh, with the recommended alternative. So, um, and that will be, like I said, um, uh, in conjunction with the state and city and our consultant. Uh, and then, um, you know, council will have an opportunity to weigh in on the alternative that we're uh, proposing to move forward with. And that would be the goal. Yep. Well, the consultant will draft a, what is considered a 100% plan, then submit it to the state. Who will then and then at some point now presumably they will have talked it through before it's submitted but then we'll get back an approved plan is that right once it's been submitted or am i wrong about that allison i will um draft assuming we agree yeah <laughs> then i will draft an approval letter and at that point then it would be an approved 100 percent plan then we then it would be on us to figure out how to implement the plan The question for people who didn't hear that is what happens if there's not agreement between the city and the state? We are a mediator. <laughs> I I don't really see that as a as an option. I think we'll we'll work to come to terms and we'll process the data enough to to get on the same page. I've never had a PER that we've written that the state has just flat out said, nope, we don't agree and we're all done. So I think this is this is a partnership. We'll see it through, and we'll we'll come to a conclusion that we're all we're all on the same page with. And I think we're we're well on the way. Thanks. Um, now we haven't had any questions from council yet, or very few, and so I want to give council members a chance to ask questions because I have a bunch, and I think probably others do also. Lauren. Thank you for sharing your microphone. Apologies that mine isn't working tonight. Um, two issues I just wanted to name, and they might be more comments than questions, but if you have um, information, one, just with climate change and knowing that precipitation patterns and erosion and everything that we anticipate, I just, I'm assuming the plan is being written with climate resilience in mind that might be bigger pipes than were previously necessary or, um, so just naming that, that I hope that's part of the calculation and that we're building to the future and not to the past. Um, and then also I've been seeing increasing reports coming out um, around the potential risks around plastic pipes. And the more we learn about petrochemical plastics, the more concerns. So I, I think HDPE seems better than PVC in terms of potential toxicity and leaching, but I know there've been a number of reports coming out and it's still not very well studied. So I could see, you know, right now being like, this is the cheapest, best option. I just don't want us to get in the place where in 10 years we're like, ah, we invested in a bunch of plastic pipes that now are a public health concern. So just putting that out. There. Yeah, those are good comments. Um, a section of the whole report is based on future planning, um, expansion, growth, and environmental impacts. So all those climate change criteria and what your flow needs will be in the future versus what they are now is all something that we consider and evaluate in terms of data. We're also, as a consultant, we're familiar with the reports on PVC pipe that have come out and are eager to see the responses from 
the other players, the plastic pipe companies, and we're going to you know, keep our finger on the pulse of the situation because it impacts definitely much more than just the city of Montpelier. So we want to see that through. Um, and that's certainly something to be considering. So that's a good comment. Is, is the main issue with, of uh, climate change, the uh, sewer and the uh, uh, groundwater uh, runoff? Yeah, most of the changes in, in the um, public utility infrastructure investment is probably going to be around stormwater, where you're seeing significantly more storm events and your design storm. Um, in terms of wastewater infrastructure, water infrastructure, um, the, the design standard used to be the 100-year flood. That was the elevation that you kept up to your critical infrastructure above. It's shifting now to the 500-year flood so we're you know that design is made that storm maybe isn't every 500 years anymore with the climate change and so investing in resiliency of the infrastructure is something that's happening industry-wide to try and protect from from those types of events um, but in in terms of uh, water system it's really more about evaluating future needs for fire flow which is kind of the design criteria for your water system so I know we're, we're talking about the minimum here and addressing violations and deficiencies which is at 500 gallons per minute uh, maintain 20 PSI, but there are places where that's not necessarily recommended or appropriate schools or elderly homes where maybe you want more flow. And so that's all when you go into the design of a significant hydraulic improvement right now where you have a six inch main that you cannot get 500 gallons a minute out of that's serving some an area that should have 1500 gallons a minute. We want it's prudent to invest in that infrastructure to support that recommended fire flow and not necessarily meet the minimum of the water supply rules. So um, that's all stuff that needs to be considered with the investment. Okay. Anybody else over this side have any questions? Um, anyone over here? Um, I just wanted to make sure that I, that I understood um, alternative two. I think you said at one point that it it could not be phased, that it it had to be done, all the work had to be done before it was actually turned on. The, the existing system would stay in place. All the new stuff would go in, presumably over a period of years. I mean, I, it's not something you do in a weekend. And then, and then the existing system would need to be replaced anyway. Uh, is that... And we would lose hydrants. Yes. Without, is, is, with, that, is that even a feasible thing to, I mean, how, how long would it take, would, would it take to do all, all that work before you could actually flip the switch? That's a great question. And Kurt's already touched on some of the stuff with issues with contract availability. And you're talking about them on some of your other issues here. That's, that's an industry wide thing. Costs are going up and construction is getting more competitive. It's harder to get people there on time. So it's pretty tough to really iron out what a real schedule is coupling that with the fact that the city doesn't own property in all these key infrastructure investment areas. And so we would have to explore acquiring property or rights to property to actually construct this infrastructure. And I don't, it's tough to say how long that would take. Um, we would have to do a revision to this report to qualify for funding to drill down those alternatives. So if this alternative two becomes, everybody says, this is what we want to do, this is feasible, this is the direction we want to head and we want to make this the basis of our funding applications, there's a lot more work to do, which was touched on in the state comments that we would have to issue amendments for, to look at these specific alternatives in more detail and their specific environmental impacts um, at the individual sites that we're looking at. Once that's all done, you go into design and permitting, get your funding through federal or state funds or locally if you can come up with the, the capacity to do so, and then the construction phase. So in terms of what we're talking about for this little investment in these pieces of infrastructures, five years would be really aggressive, 10 years probably achievable. Um, that's just off the top of my head. And then it comes down to one day where you turn it on. Pretty much, yeah. It would. I mean, there's a, everybody else has mentioned this. this is, need to be significant interaction with the with the higher stakeholders you, you're talking about when you go turn that on without significant investment in the distribution system you lose hydrants and your your sprinkler systems develop issues so interacting with those people who would be privately impacted in terms of the cost would be critical and coming up with a plan and working through we're gonna this is the date we're gonna cycle the valves and the pressure is going to be reduced and we need to be prepared for that so it's 
it's uh, you know heading down this pressure reduction alternative. We reviewed it as feasible because it was specifically targeted in the permit to operate application or the permit to operate that came out. It was very much angled to you need to look at reducing your pressures, and we tried to do that with the most, like I said, the best bang for your buck. How much pressure can we pull out of here for an optimized level of investment? But there are a lot of complexities in here beyond just capital investment that really need would need to be explored significantly before this this would come to fruition. Well, that's one of the things that real, I was really struck by, especially alternative two. It seems like it's very, I don't want to say Rube Goldberg, but it seems like it's very complicated because there are places where we need to knock the pressure down. And then after we knock the pressure down, we have to pump it up again. And it seems like that's a lot to uh, have to design into the system. Is that a fair uh, comment? It is. And that I should highlight that what we recommended isn't the only way to do this. There are You can dice this up into as many pressure zones as you want and booster stations and cut the zones however you want. If there are key areas where you're seeing a lot of breaks and you believe that you have pressure-related transient issues, you could drill that down and look at, we're only going to look at this one street and look at a more localized pressure reduction because it's it's specific. If we had that data to evaluate specific areas of the system where we're seeing phenomenon happen, we could explore that for sure. But when you're talking about a, a system-wide adjustment to, pres to pressure, regardless of how you do it with dedicated fill lines to the tanks or however you reduce your pressure zones, it's just a, a very complex um, and significant investment in, in critical infrastructure. Now, I've got a bunch of questions. I, if it's okay. I've got a bunch of questions some of which are like the the most elementary uh, concrete questions that I think come out of uh, comments I've heard from members of the public. Like we hear people talk about problems they've had in their homes with uh, pipes breaking and water heater uh, blowing up because of pressure and that kind of thing. Was would every homeowner who has a pressure relief valve in their home know that they have it? I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I would if it were my home, but I live and breathe this stuff. So yeah, yeah it's it's different. I maybe not, you know, maybe you don't know. And maybe that's a an effort that we need to make is how are we getting this message out to the public? Can we provide some education on here's what a PRV looks like? Check and see if you have one. If you do. Maybe have somebody come in and check it, make sure it's it's new or functional or operable, and then try and make a schedule to get it maintained or replaced. They're typically protected by tr uh, strainers or screens. If you have issues with sediment, I know I've, I've heard some feedback about breaks and sediment or, or uh, debris from, from tuberculation within the pipe getting into the PRVs and causing issues. You want to invest in a, a home house filter, cartridge filter to help protect from sediment. It's also an option. Inside your home, there, there are a lot of things you can do, but if you're connected to a high pressure system or what's viewed generally as a high pressure system, if I have a, over 150 PSI and I know my pressure needs to be reduced, I would want to explore that. What, what can I do to protect myself? And getting that message out to the public on what sort of things to be looking for and what kind of maintenance to perform is, I think, something that we want to flush out a little further and find a way to document that in the next provision of the report. Mm -hmm. um and I assume the city doesn't know who has pressure relief valves and who doesn't. It's, there's not part of the information we have about the system as a whole. No, we do not have records on that. Is, is the same thing true of uh, sprinkler systems? Uh, that would fall more in the fire, fire department. Um, I, I believe we do have records of all that. We have records of everybody who's applied for the sprinkler credit. And even if you have, and you have to get to have a permit to have a sprinkler system. Okay, so. Um, are, is it possible to quantify the uh, contribution of the uh, water pressure in the system to main breaks? as opposed to other causes of, uh, of water main breaks? Not very easily. Um, the best way to do that 
specifically for the system would be to maintain records of the breaks and track that back to if there was anything else going on in the system that caused some sort of pressure related um, phenomenon, some sort of change in pressure, and then the actual um, failure method of the pipe or the fitting or whatever happened. Um, like a lot of the failures that you're seeing on East State Street and some of these areas, areas where you have corrosive soils are galvanic in nature and you can visibly tell that they're pinhole specific areas that have had material pulled away through through um, an electrical current over the course of time and um, maybe you could say that the pressure would if it was a lower pressure it wouldn't have broken that day maybe it would have broken if you were 150 psi versus 200 psi two months later but it would be really difficult to say that that never would have happened if we were a lower pressure and that being able to quantify you know how many breaks necessarily per year we could say are associated with pressure is something that we want to try and flush out and we're going to try and do some research and look at AWWA reports and see if anybody's trended statistics it's just it's difficult because when you're looking at reports like that they're just applied industry wide and they're really broad they're not necessarily specific to what's going on here and trying to to recoil that back into what costs are feel appropriate for this community is is what we want to do and that's something that we we're going to work with the state on back and forth what costs feel appropriate so i can tell you that i looked at a um just for preliminary ballpark numbers i figured um four breaks a year you could say you would reduce by pressure when i was playing with numbers and that that's like a 30 ish 33 percent ish reduction on what you've seen over the past five years or so i think that's reasonable to assume and flush out with costs but um we're going to explore that. We're going to continue to explore that. Uh -huh. And electricity is a contributing factor because people's uh, water or electric systems are bas basically grounded to the uh, plumbing system. That could definitely be a contributing factor. Um, the, the combination of acidity, so your soil materials and your pipe materials, dissimilar materials, acidity, and the electrical properties of the material to resist current all come into into play and you could and you know basically you, you could build a battery without any current really generated and start to develop passive current passive current if the conditions were correct but i suspect that grounding electrical systems to the water mains or in the area of water mains and getting that that stray current to hop onto the water main is is a phenomenon that you're seeing here and is there a way to address that like can we tell people you can't ground to the water I, system you I'm just have to drive a spike into the ground sure, but i think that already is not a thing i don't think you can do that but i don't know as far as demanding home inspections and sending the electrical inspector into everybody's home and forcing them to remove i don't know about uh -huh. that it's outside of my realm of expertise yeah oh chief yeah uh, you have to ground to um a grounding rod in your footings in in the footings of the home so yeah, so the new code does not allow that. But that only applies to new construction. What's built. Yep. Yeah. Done. Have an estimate of how many you think might do that now? Currently? Yeah. You know, before the when the rule. The, when did the code go into place, Tim? Three years, four years ago? <laughs> Whatever's been built in that it's like whatever. <laughs> the majority of it's still on water pipes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Thank you. Yeah. Um, when we have uh, breaks in water mains and we have to devote uh, money to uh, doing those repairs, does that set us back in the scheduled or or projected uh, replacement of uh, of water mains that we're supposed to be doing. Um, so yeah, I mean it's all it's all the same the same fund you know the same user base that's paying for the repairs versus the replacement. So yeah, if we had um, less costs associated with water repairs, that would be more that we could invest in new infrastructure. Um, but, but we are, like I said, still hitting our targets. But you know we could accelerate the replacement. And the targets are built based on knowing that we're also going to have a certain level of uh, repairs, right? Right. We have repairs built into the operating budget and in a line item. Uh-huh. 
Now, I've heard people claim that we don't know where water mains are, that we had a project that was being done just the other day that the contractor missed the water main by two feet and it caused a delay in the system, in the work for a whole day. Um, and I, it sounds absurd in the face of it, but I, since you're here, I thought, well, let's address that. Is, is that a, Accurate statement. Um, so we have a very old system. Most uh, most of our um, utilities are well marked and documented. We have um, a GIS database that we maintain that um, that is kind of a you know a high level uh, view of where all the the pipes are in the ground. There are cases where um, our maps are off. That does happen. So I can't say. That they're all 100% accurate, and and some of the older infrastructure, there's no, you know, construction plan available for it. So, um, you know, there are some areas that are not well mapped, but I would say, as a whole, the system is is well documented. Okay, thanks. Um, there was a question raised about uh, how to get at economic losses uh, occasioned by uh, by water main breaks. Have is it is it possible, or have we thought about like going around to talk to, talk to the neighboring uh, property owners when there's a break to see if there's if they can report what what the effect on them was, and would that even be the way to do it? Well, that's not something that that we have done. It is some something that we're going to um, try to quantify in the final PER, um, put some numbers to that. That's not a discussion we've had with the state yet. Um, uh, Dufresne Group has developed um, sort of a, a preliminary estimate of, with some numbers. We just haven't um, you know, met with them and reviewed that yet. Um, it's certainly something we could um, entertain. We are working on, uh, back to an earlier question about um, sort of documenting the the break type uh, and the cause of failure in the, in the mains. Um, we're, develop we're implementing a new asset management program um, that will really um, enhance the way we're able to document things in the field with our staff. You know, we'll have you know a tablet where they can take a photo of the failure, and and we'll automatically log in our GIS map. You know, put the location in with the photo, so you can determine the type of failure. So we're working on better data collection. Um, it's fairly rare that um, there's really a documented loss unless it's a business. It's hard to document um, impacts to a homeowner because um, you know, it's more of like a inconvenience than a monetary value that's lost. Um, so I think maybe for the the bigger breaks in the downtown, um, we could we could look into that. Um, but I don't, but it's hard to quantify on the homeowner basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the last question for right now. See, you we new mayor but still a lot of questions coming from the seat uh, another another uh question what's the effect of uh of abandoning the uh, fire hydrants that we're talking about it seems like if, if that were my neighborhood and i wasn't going to have a fire hydrant next to uh, close to my house i'd be uh, pretty concerned yeah i, I think and the chief's here too I, yeah, and, and maybe the chief would like to weigh in, but I I think that that's a good perspective to be considering, and something that the council should be thinking about is that it's um, there's the ISO rates and the impact to actual insurance rates that people will be paying if there's a reduction in the ISO rate or your home is no longer near an available hydrant, and then there's the actual you know how how would I quantify a fire taking place and my inability or my reduction in my ability to, to fight that fire in an area where I lost a hydrant or hydrant cut removed from service because it was deficient. And that's, I, that's tough to put numbers to. And that's something we're, we're going to try and work on, but definitely something to be considering. Thanks. G yeah. I, uh, I was uh, glad Scott mentioned the ISO rating because that will affect everyone. Not just, it won't just affect your street. It'll affect the entire city. Additionally, though, your ins your individual insurance rates will go up because you're now living in a neighborhood without fire protection. 
but the entire city's ISO rating will, will be significantly impacted by that. You know, 34 hydrants, some of those hydrants, some of those 34 that Scott mentioned are in the downtown area where we need them the most. National life, uh, the, heat, the heat and woods area. So areas where we need hydrants the most is where, where those 34 have been identified. So that, it, that would have a significant impact. And on this drawing, each one of these X's is a separate uh, hydrant? No, that these are uh, nodes from our water models. We overlaid these on to the GIS um, data from the city to actually try and quantify the hydrants. So these this better articulates the areas and um, the number of hydrants is roughly 32. Okay, thanks. Okay, did that stimulate any questions for members of the council? Uh, Mr. Muller. Um, just some quick comments for insights, uh, Scott Muller, Montpelier. Um, I'm a civil environmental engineer. I'm not licensed PE in Vermont. Um, I've been working 25 years with the largest and fastest growing cities in the world. Um, I'm familiar with a lot of these issues. Um, first is uh, local government's the hero of the planet and the work you're doing is admirable. It's really hard to immerse yourself in these technical subjects talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. That's um, tough to do uh, in one evening. Um, I've interacted with the city on this issue for a number of years due to money from blowing pressure zone, pressure um, valves on our house, from blown out water bladders on the hydro uh, tanks, static tanks, um, and also a noise nuisance, uh, which the city has lots of data that's measured from the consultants they've hired, um, including um, one person selling their home because of the noise nuisance. So this is more than water breaks, yeah? Um, one comment, I don't really have any comments to the state plan. Um, it's a slow burn. Uh, you made some great comments today. Um, it's great to see the progress. Um, and also the state's oversight is very welcome. Um, it's um, an important mandate and their technical skills are, are top notch. Um, I do have one comment on the maps though, and you mentioned are the maps accurate. Uh, just yesterday across Main Street, uh, they broke a three inch pipe that was not on the maps going across the intersection there, which sprayed water three floors up onto the bank and they couldn't shut it off. When they called the Municipal Department of Public Works, it took them three and a half hours to find the valve to turn it off. Yeah. Um, and then by coincidence, unfortunately, in the disarray later that day, uh, a bus on the corner hit one of the workers uh, right at that site um, this past weekend. Um, so what I am surprised about in this whole process has been the city's response to um, what are basic engineering norms. These aren't state guidelines. These are American Water Works engineering norms you're taught as a freshman. 60 to 90 PSI in a city because it destroys the municipal water system if it's not. That's pretty blanket engineering. So I was really surprised to see in these comments going back and forth in some of the permit states reaction was, well, it says shall not should. Um, some of, I think the unseemly emails that came out from the diggers reporting about this means war and that kind of thing uh, is just odd. Um, and I want to highlight that that, this water issue is, is complicated. It's, you know, but I'm here to advocate for the $80 million fix. This is a 50 year infrastructure that needs to be done right, flat, bing, bang, boom, get it out of the way, move on to other subjects. Yeah, there's experts in the room who can do this. It has a fix, it's been done before. Fix it right the first time, yeah? Um, one of the issues we have here, um, is that what seems to be manifesting in this issue uh, has manifested before in other major issues in the city, is, and it's a governance challenge. It comes up all the time in these urban soft and hard infrastructure things. It's a governance challenge. And you can break that down, in, especially with the TIF, uh, you know, the gerrymandered TIF fiasco. There were governance challenges there that were really important to fix to get a proper engineered solution in the end. Part of that is participation. Good governance depends on participation. 
Section 1.2 in the report talks about public participation. I think this, this is the first time I've been involved with this or I've been informed of it. So I was happy to be here. I would encourage more partici participation from engineers in the city, finding out whose water pressure valves have broke, who has suffered damage, who's actually you know, bothered by the nuisance noise. Um, that's really important. Second is transparency. Transparency is an also important tenet of good governance. When we were trying to get the reports about breakages in the streets, it took a long time. Um, the costs on those, they're not that hard to figure out. The indirect costs are hard. The cost of the frost heaves from all the water freezing under the streets, the other indirect costs in the, in, in, to the city are significant. But the direct costs, you know, this, this is not a new problem uh, in cities. Transparency is really important. Um, the third uh, is not How are we a, doing on time, Donna? Thanks. The third and last point is uh, accountability. The city's needs aren't the same as they were 20 years ago. Um, this project hasn't been addressed for 25 years since the water treatment plant was built in 94, something like that. At that time, the Department of Public Works was calling for a revamp of the pressure systems in the city. It hasn't been attended to. So city okay. council, accountable, please. Thank you. Make the investment now. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, thanks. Um, this has been very informative. I don't, I don't see any anyone on either side of this saying that we're this is war between the city and the state I, and i don't think anyone can review the reports from uh dufresne group and from uh dpw and say this has not been being taken seriously uh, can you give us a timeline on what to expect next and if you can't that's fine um i think we want to come come back to the table with Dana and Allison and the state and really flesh out these costs associated with some of these more subjective issues and see if we can we can come up with a a sharper life cycle cost analysis and I think that will kind of drive where the conversation goes. Um, maintaining perspective of the actual violation in the water supply or in the uh, permit to operate and addressing those existing deficiencies with hydrants I think is important. Um, but I guess all, all I can really say is that it's a priority for us. It's a priority for me. It's clearly a priority for the city. And I know that Allison and Dana are also on board with maintaining progress on this. I don't think we want to see this just stay stagnant. That being said, this um, if new data becomes available that we can consider and, and look at specific areas or, or if anything happens that would update how we want to take a look at this, we're flexible to doing that. So. Um, considering public comment, this meeting was important to us. I think it was important to the whole team in the state, um, getting council up to speed and, and hearing your thoughts. So I guess we'll keep our foot on the gas, but I, I'm not sure if I can promise any real timeline. I'm totally sorry. fair. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot. Great work. This is a very worthwhile uh, conversation. Thank you. Thanks again to Dana and Allison for coming, joining us. We appreciate it. I'm sure you had better things to do tonight. How is that possible? Well, <laughs> well the entertainment. All right. We are up to item number 10, the resolution on homelessness. Is that uh, Kelly? And we, uh, our members. So basically, the homelessness task force uh, has been discussing a lot of issues. As you know, we had a press conference last night and a work session, um, but they did pass a resolution that they'd like the council to consider, and it's in your packet. I don't know if I have much more to add to it than that. So, okay. Um, what do we want to do here? We have the uh, the draft resolution. Um, I think everyone on the council has had the opportunity to review it. Terry? Yeah, I move that we approve the resolution as presented by the Homelessness Task Force. I'll second the motion. So any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Next up. Uh, 
I just really want to thank them for taking the time to do it. I think it's really important. All right. Thanks for coming out, folks. I know it's a long night. Next up, uh, item 11, uh, Chapter 11, Ordinance Amendment. So uh, Chief Nordson is on his way up and start uh, noting there were a couple of discrepancies in the information that you were sent. Uh, we're not calling for a repeal of the entire ordinance. We're talking about the penalty section. And uh, we fabricated a section of the, not fabricated, it's a rotten order. We, we created out of nowhere a section of the ordinance that probably isn't the right place. Section 11-1103 is not where this should go. So we'll get those straightened out. Um, but just so we're clear, this is actually a discussion of the potential policy. If it's something you want to go forward with, we would then warn it for first reading and second reading uh, at upcoming council meetings. And we will be sure to make sure that all the citations are where they're supposed to be and have it legally reviewed. This is really uh, to get in front of you and have the chief explain his thinking. And, um, and in a bigger picture, you know, talking about some of these issues with homelessness and others is we've been trying to work with our neighboring communities to be more consistent uh, with one another, with Berrien City and Berlin as to how we address that they're looking at our encampment policy and we're looking at kind of how they're dealing with these types of infractions. So um, that'll turn over to Chief Nords. Great, Dick. thank you. Um, real quick, just a little background on this. Um, we're going through quite a bit of the police review committee recommendations that we haven't addressed and ordinances has been one of them. Uh, the police review committee recommended a complete abolishment of this ordinance. And as a way to kind of address it, we tried to find a different way to we keep the ordinance, but have a different penalty structure. Um, which included a restorative process and also a referral to our turning point uh, peer support outreach workers. So we thought that was a pretty good balance for what they were recommending, gave us a handle on what was happening in the community, got us to have an enforcement piece um, that also focused on them, the person who was the offender, uh, giving them a chance to right the wrong, and also getting them help if they needed help. So um, the other the other thing we learned was it mirrors what Barry City is doing, and a lot of our responses were trying to, like like Bill said, try to mirror what they're doing. Um, there was no change in any of the actual wording of the uh, the ordinance itself. And again, I made the mistake of putting the, the penalty at section 1105 or 1103. I didn't know where to put that. So uh, the number really doesn't mean much other than the words. So anyways, the, the idea would be instead of cur the current practice now is that um, if we deal with an open container violation, which walking downtown, the, the merchants has been a, a big complaint for us. Um, our only option right now is to issue a citation, which is basically an invitation into court. Um, and that is prosecuted by the city attorney. So if you know you have to hire the attorney, the attorney gets pretty expensive. What we're finding, it goes to court, it gets dismissed. Um, so it's been expensive and there's not really any benefit to the city. So the, the solution that we propose is very similar to a traffic ticket. Um, it's called a municipal ordinance ticket. It has a fee structure and the, and the cases are prosecuted by the police officer, officer themselves at the Judicial Bureau. So less intrusive. Um, the first, the first option would be restorative justice and talking to Carol at the, the Justice Center. Uh, there was some concern if uh, we referred everybody to the Justice Center, the success rates might be pretty hard to achieve. Um, so there would be a self-referral component. So someone who is willing to participate in the program would have the option to do that. Otherwise, they go through the civil process of the ticket. Um, so as you can see, there's some there's some penalties involved uh, for the first offense, second offense, then the third offense. And there's always the option if we're having a repeat offender, three, four, five, six, and it's just not working, that we can then send it to the city attorney. Um, so just kind of get the, the ball going. Uh, this would also be pretty valuable for noise complaints and things like that, where we're sending them in, in front of superior court for a judge um, when we could just do a municipal penalty. You see that in a lot of college towns uh, where they just issue a ticket uh, for noise complaints. It's less intrusive. And again, you'd have a restorative component. So that's something I'll probably talk about later on. But the, the alcohol one was the one that had the most impact downtown when I'm meeting with the with the merchants. How do we how do we handle this? Um, and the way we're doing it right now, quite frankly, it's not working. So uh, this was the best I could come up with. Thanks. Questions, anybody? Carrie. I have a lot of questions. 
but I won't, I won't ask them all right off. <laughs> um, so uh, can you clarify if you, if you know where in the ordinances, and maybe Bill can answer this, it currently talks about penalties and enforcement for this stuff. So that's the tricky part. Um, it's not overly clear, but it has the general in chapter one, there's some mention of certain things. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to make it really clear. And I think that's been one of our yeah. hurdles with a lot of the ordinances to get some clarity. And so in, in chapter one, it talks about general provisions, but it's also not, it's just not super called out. But then we did an alternate approach with dog violations, which I believe is seven. And so in chapter one, it specifically calls out the dog section by number and says, these will be through the justice, you know, restorative justice and other path, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, this would okay. somehow be put in here and just saying this section, anything under this section and maybe others, uh, or maybe even all of them. Like this yeah. and, and your intention, I, as I understand it, is that this would apply to everything under chapter 11. So we initially discussed that the alcohol and then, yeah. you know, as I kept digging into the review committee's recommendations, they, they would like an overview of the entire ordinance structure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I see some value in having that discussion at some point. Um, but the focus right now is the, the merchants downtown are having a hard time with the open container consumption. We're having a hard time dealing with it because the penalties are non-existent and it's expensive for us to do. So what do we do? So we try to come up with a solution that is somewhat manageable. Is this a be all end all to, to the problem? Probably not. Um, does it does it help a little bit? Um, the feedback I got from Barry City is it, it's helped just writing a ticket. Um, so if, if it helps, great. If it helps one person with a referral to turning point, is it worth it? I would say, yes, it is. Um, so yeah, I, are we gonna solve the entire problem? Probably not. Okay. So then my next question is about um, people actually paying these fines. Do people actually pay them? And, <laughs> and especially, you know, seeing them escalate at, pretty quickly, it gets to a point where I think a lot of the people you're writing these tickets to will be like, well, I can't pay $250. I can't pay $500. It just starts to become abstract. You know, they're, they're not going to pay. And, and so is, is, if the goal is to reduce public drinking, um, how does it, how does this accomplish that goal? Sure. Sure. So that penalty is whatever you folks would like it to be. Mm -hmm. This just mirrored what Barry city was doing. It was a, it was a norm that I could say, Hey, this is what our neighboring community has done a lawful review of. So it could be a dollar. It could be whatever you want it to be. The idea is that we have a tool to, to stop the ongoing problem that we have and then offer a solution through restorative justice or uh, peer support. And if they don't take those, there's the penalty here. So we open the door for a free solution. And if they don't accept that, then this is the penalty. Are you good? We're going Go to ahead. Stop for now. For now. <laughs> Lauren. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Slightly awkward. <laughs> um, so thank you, Chief, and really appreciate that the uh, police review committee recommendations that you all are continuing to work through them. And you know, I think generally like moving in the direction. I was trying to remember back to the process and the conversation and, you know, as you framed it, um, you know, the issue had come to us in part with, you know, knowing that citations were just getting thrown out. And so it was just this big waste. And a lot of our conversation revolved around, you know, what we're really trying to prevent our behaviors associated with people who then are intoxicated, as opposed to the fact of just having an open container isn't inherently a problem unless it's leading to behaviors that then become problematic. So we had focused more on, is there a way or are there gaps in how we're able to address problem behaviors as opposed to the container itself? Um, I, you know, and I know we had a lot of conversation about like, do you have the right tools to be able to kind of prevent problem behavior. Some of the conversation had been around, you know, this has been used sometimes to target certain people or, you know, are there, um, you know, equity considerations around who ends up, you know, getting cited for this and who doesn't. And, you know, like there's people paying a lot of money to sit in the street and have a glass of wine, but you walk by and you don't have housing or the money to do that. And you could get fined, but you can be sitting there 
having a drink in open container on the street. So that was a lot of the conversation that we had at the police review committee around, you know, how are we treating people and what is this accomplishing? So I guess, you know, if, if we're pursuing this first, I would just love to get some of the uh, folks who have been part of the committee um, engaged. I'm sure they would be in like the next, if we decide we want to move forward with this, um, just to to refresh, because there was lots of robust conversation. Um, and I know you were there for a lot of it. Um, so just to, was just trying to share some of that for the other folks who weren't part of it. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is like, again, I think moving in the right direction of keeping people out of the court system and having the restorative justice, that was a specific piece of what we wanted to see too. So great to see both of those. And just, I guess, just still thinking through that piece of, you know, what are we trying to solve here? And how do we address um, equity issues that arise by approaching it this way? And is there are there other paths to you know avoid those potential pitfalls? Yeah, no, thank you for those questions and and that feedback. I I've, I've been spending a lot of time downtown, and the merchants are wanting that addressed. So you know, while I I'm sympathetic to that, I think we still need to address some of the root causes, which are substance abuse here. And if we can get those people through either restorative justice or through turning points. Um, and get them the help, like, let's do that. Why wait until the behavior is such that now I have to deal with them and typically the only way I can deal with them is take them to, take them to jail. Like that doesn't make a lot of sense. Why can't I stop it beforehand before they're too drunk? I gotta take them into protective custody and then I have to take them to jail. That's my only option. And uh, it just doesn't make that much sense mm -hmm. to me. But. Um. Are you planning to put um, signs at downtown because you mentioned the parking ticket and people know that when they will get the ticket, right? There's a oh, maximum like two hours parking. So are you planning to do something about drinking too? You know, like, oh, if you drink that much and make that much noise, this will be how people know that there will be like a ticketing system or something sure. and how will this like if we are planning to put signs up then <laughs> how will it affect our downtown environment sure thank you there's a there's a whole wave of sign pollution and light pollution so i'm very sympathetic to all those things i i don't think there's any intention to put a sign of every city ordinance that's there um but i can tell you that like our staff typically the, the ticket isn't the first option we try to have deal with the issue, just get them help. Also to respond to that, it's already against our ordinances to, to drink in public unless you're in a licensed area. So, um, so you know, you can't walk down the street drinking a beer now and there's not signs. The only difference is what, what you get cited for, if, should you do that. So instead of being cited into court for a violation of municipal law ordinance, you'd be given a, a ticket, like a, you could just pay it or, or do the other options. You know, and the common question I get from the merchants is, "Why can't I just walk downtown and drink?" And I'm just like, "Okay, not a not an unreasonable question." And you know, just trying to have the tools to kind of keep some order downtown, if that's what you'd like. Um, that point that we now have a citation that goes to court, and then we're proposing a ticket. I, I, I that seems a good change, and I, definitely having the restorative process here, but just in how it's written, it's sort of hidden. So if, if indeed we were going to pass this, I guess I would, I definitely would suggest some change in the headings and numbering because I had really had to hunt for it. I mean, it, it, so I think that's really important too, is how we present it within the ordinance. Yeah, well, okay, keeping in mind that this is what tonight is, yeah. are we deciding to proceed with the conversation and then staff will what draft it, Harry? Yeah. Um, so I I like this. I think it's a good idea. I'm I'm kind of thinking of it uh, as two separate issues here, which I know you're not. <laughs> I know that's not where it's coming from. But to, but in my mind, there's a question about enforcement and penalties for our violations of our ordinances. And I think that you know having a citation that doesn't really mean anything is not a good idea. And so I think it's great to have it spelled out. This is what's going to happen. I think it should apply to other things, not just the public drinking. So I think this would be a great addition to our ordinances. I think it would be, and I can see how it'd be really helpful in what you're doing. The question about uh, addressing the recommendation that came from the police review committee, I, this 
that feels like it needs more attention still, I guess. I, I don't want to, um, to put this into our ordinances and then say, we took care of that recommendation, we addressed it. Because I think as Lauren talked about, the, and the real problems that we're facing are behavioral problems. And there are, I'm sure that there, are, uh, depending on how you behave, if you're downtown and you're sitting on a park bench drinking a beer, you might or might not get attention from the police, right? So the problem is the behavior. And, um, and I think we still, we can't give up on finding all the ways we can to address that. And, it, and, and law enforcement has only certain tools available to them. And you're, I think you're doing a great job of figuring out how to use those tools and how to improve on them. I think that we have a bigger conversation to have about um, how to address the, the cultural problems and the problems that the folks in town are facing. So I just don't want to let that go. That's no, I, I appreciate that. And that's yeah. that's why I prefaced everything with the recommendations from the PRC. And yeah. this is not exactly what they wanted. So I think I have to be fair to what, what they asked for. And I'm not delivering exactly what they asked for. I'm hoping that I get something that is a compromise and meets most of the needs that they were recommending. So anybody else? Okay, so what's your pleasure? Should we uh, does it take a motion to but or you know, I mean, I guess just get a sense. Yeah, I mean, would you like us to come back with this, you know, more fleshed out or yeah, Don or Lauren, let's one question I have for efficiency and knowing we have limited bandwidth as a council, are there other pieces of the report or other ordinance changes like to me bundling changes to our ordinance to address PRC recommendations might make sense and seeing this as a step is great um so I guess it's just like would there be more things coming and is there a way to just make it more efficient for us and it might be worth waiting to do it more as a package if that's kind of forthcoming you know I, I was as uh, Carrie was talking about chapter 11 I pulled that up on my screen See, well, what else is included in Chapter 11? Curfew, litter, obstruction of streets and sidewalks, advertising, firearms, BB guns, gun bows and arrows, and similar weapons, morals and conduct, drinking in unlicensed places, alarm systems, noise control, smoking within city parks. So, so there's kind of a lot. And you're right, it's all behavior stuff. <laughs> So, so to answer some of those, I had some notes on those because I was hoping the curfew would be removed. I think that's pretty archaic if you look at the actual writing on that. Um, I think gambling was already removed. I couldn't find that in there. And then I'd rather the police not be used for smoking in city parks. To be fair, I don't think that's something that we should be doing. Um, you guys can tell me otherwise, but uh, it's, um, but I think the, the morals and conduct of off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what that was, but uh, the alarm systems would be very useful. We get a lot of alarms that are false alarms that um, there's a there's a penalty for those if we keep going. Um, it's a little tricky to use, but if we did it as a civil ticket, I think people would get a better handle on their alarms. Um, and you know, when you keep going and there's no there's no financial penalty for the sixth or seventh time, uh, they don't care. Um, all of a sudden, if it's 200 bucks and they had to get out of bed at two o'clock in the morning to let us in the door to make sure it's okay, it changes things a little bit. So I'm not saying we need to hammer people, but there should be some accountability piece for having multiple pulse alarms. So, um, so that and um, the, the noise, I think, was a, a really good one to lump in there. But you guys had asked, or the police review committee had asked for an overhaul of that stuff. And the, our discussion in-house, just based on my foot patrols downtown, was the alcohol. And that's kind of what started this conversation. Um, and I knew it would span. And I, I was just kind of said, let's just focus on the alcohol right now. But Chapter 11 makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. With your review of all Chapter 11, with your recommendations, and then all of us can study it and have ours. Maybe by the next meeting. And part of what you're interested in is getting something in so we don't have a summer of people being obnoxious <laughs> drunks on the street. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge to address some of the complaints that we have, knowing the outcomes already. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, you know, the sooner we could get something that might have a positive outcome, the better. Um, I'm going to be out with Turning Point on Friday to try and make some positive inroads with some people already. Um, we have a new outreach worker and I'll have his name and contact information in the weekly report, but we'll try and continue to make those outreaches before it becomes a problem with us. So. Compromise. You would like to have this pass now, and then bundle the rest. No, I mean, I mean to to progress on push this one forward with the idea that we're going to come back and do all of Chapter Eleven. But, but if I may paraphrase what I think I'm hearing, is there's general support to move forward with this concept. We'd like to do as much as possible together, and and we'll see what how much we can and the chief and. Them. Well, like all of them, chapter 11, right? Or, yeah, I or the general penalty provision mm -hmm. and in the noise, perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why some parts of chapter 11 wouldn't be covered by this or other things. So, yeah, I'm interested in that kind of broader question about penalties and enforcement. And it seems like, I mean, you're writing a ticket, you know, it's like a, like a parking ticket or something. It's, it seems like a, pretty reasonable way to go. So I'm not sure why we would exclude other parts of it. I agree. Yeah. yeah. No, we, so we might we agree. Do that quicker yeah. Than, yeah. yeah, I actually pretty much have it ready to go. So, okay. yeah. But so we think what we'll do is we'll have another discussion with more fleshed out discussion at our next meeting and then be prepared to do to warn an amendment. In, in a really good situation, we'd have a first reading next meeting and then we can you can always amend that before the second meeting but that would keep it on the track to be done by june whatever the first june is. Um, okay. and if if we're way off base at first reading you can you know it doesn't but we didn't want to you know particularly with new people we didn't want to just spring a first reading of a warning you know uh, ordinance without a policy conversation to see if people were okay with it. So it was a little bit about being serious. It does it take a vote to tell you to set a first reading? No, we often do that. So. Okay, sound good to everybody. But you can if you want. Mm -hmm. oh. kind. We we don't need to have a vote. You, yeah, I think you know what the people are saying. Got it. Okay. Um, right. So it's better to put it as a first reading. Then we have the option. And and sometimes we have more than one first reading. Yes, that's been known to happen. All right. Next up, survey. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Survey presentation. How are we doing for? So, so all we have left is this: the summer schedule, which I hope won't be terribly uh, contentious, and council reports. So, everybody okay with the with staying on to? hear the survey presentation and this is not we're not going through the line of every single survey i mean kelly has a presentation yeah okay and i will and i will just tell you how this came about you know we did the survey and i i urge you all to take a look at it and i can't remember if we gave you copies of it the councilman yeah um right and um but we did it it finished up last fall and it was right about the time we were getting ready for budget and we also knew that a couple of our members might be departing. And so, you know, I remember doing a sort of a really quick highlight of some of the key things like, like a one pager. Um, but then we realized we never actually sort of debriefed the survey with the full council and Kelly did it for the, the leadership team a, a month or so ago. And we all said, Hey, this is really concise. It was well done. And we have three new council members. Let's, let's just walk through the highlights so everyone can see it. And, you know, it's, well, it's just a good snapshot of what our community responded um, to the questions they were asked. And we've, you know, we think it's a valuable tool that obviously we want to keep doing every couple of years. But with that, I'll turn it right to the boss. Went through a quick overview of um, our national community survey. We did this last fall. Um, that's when we had the results right before the budget. Um, but we really wanted to take the opportunity to highlight some of the um, results of the survey because some of them are good and some of them are not so good. Um, and so I think it's really an opportunity to kind of think about some of these things, especially as we proceed with decision making. Um, so I'm just going to get into it. Um, 
So just moving right along here, just to remind you all and for the folks in the audience of you know what our goals are. Um, and so you, you'll see further on in the slides, and we've mentioned this as part of our strategic planning process, um, some of the items that um, are associated with these items have also been called out um, in our benchmarking. Um, so I won't go into detail there. Um, and so just to, you know, to see what the report looks like, you can also find this on our website. We also did post the Tableau um, data for people to take a look at, and there's a little bit more there in terms of functionality. Um, so if you wanted to take a look at that, or if you wanted to drill down in any of the categories based on demographics, then you can do that as well. Um, so just in summary, um, this just is sort of the, the set standards of the survey. Um, so the report provides opinions of the representative a sample of 745 people from 2,800 households sampled, um, and the margin of error was 4%. The response rate was 27%. Um, I will note that we are working to make sure that we can do this um, in the recommended two-year cycle. Um, so the next time we would do this would be in the fall of 2024. Um, but we've got this really nice benchmark now. Um, and then, you know, just to note, as we get into the results, everything is really reported as a positive percentage. Um, so folks that sort of agreed with the general sentiment. Um, and then just to note um, what sort of the meaning is between higher or lower. Um, so the higher or lower benchmark meanings are a 10 point difference and then the much higher or much lower are 20 point difference. So you can kind of see the significance in that data. And then as we get on um, in the short presentation, uh, we've got it sort of sliced and diced based on the report. The report is quite extensive, um, but just sort of the summary and introduction, um, survey responses, the open-ended response, and then some of the comparisons from the uh, 2009 survey. So here, this is a little hard to see, so sorry about that, um, but you can kind of see uh, what the demographics are here. Um, and one of the things to point out is that the middle column is sort of the, the weighted uh, totals um, against sort of the target, the unweighted or the actual responses. Yes. Means I wasn't able to find that in the report and the, the sure. reference link went yeah. nowhere. I have to, yes, and I actually wanted to identify that, um, so I'm glad that you asked. Um, so weighted is just to sort of weight to the composite of the demographics within the community. And so with the results that we got back, we might not have gotten sort of the, the targeted weight. Um, and so that weighted middle column brings everything kind of up to that. So does that mean they count those responses enough to, so say there was one response and we should have had five, they count it five times to match the... They weighed it so that it matches yes. the person. Thank you. Yes, that's right. Um, and to make sure that then the survey results are representative of what we'd see within the population. Um, and so you can kind of see what the breakdown uh, is uh, for those that responded in the unweighted column. The weighted column is sort of how that kind of sugared off and what the target um, would be. So it's pretty close there. Um, so then on to the slide, um, this is a, a summary of sort of the facets of livability um, and sort of gauging, you know, what things within a community um, we might want to to reference. Um, and so you can see in kind of the smaller um, section there, it's economy, mobility, community design, utilities, safety, natural environment, parks and recreation, health and wellness, education, arts, culture, inclusivity and engagement. So there's a lot, pretty much. That's what that means. There's a lot. Um, and so you can kind of see on the slide that there are um, some areas where, you know, you've got the percentages here. And so that's, you know, where we've ranked. And then you can see that, you know, versus the benchmark for the community survey. And a lot of instances were, were similar, but there are some instances where we're either lower, like for instance, in our utility infrastructure, or we're higher um, in our community engagement. And so we just wanted to call out some of those things. Uh, this next slide, I really um, like um, just being sort of how I am, um, but, you know, just looking at sort of the um, this diagram, looking at the quality and the importance and then looking at the quadrants. So then seeing where things from those um, facets of community health land. And you can see if you look over, um, well, I guess this would be my right hand side lower quadrant, the you know, scale of quality and importance, you can see that mobility and economy and utilities all are sort of in this area that really kind of needs some attention. So it's just, you know, a visual representation of that. 
And so this is kind of the, the slide that has come through um, and the summary that, that Bill did when we did get the results of um, this survey, um, those items that are in bold. And again, apologies, there, it's a little hard to see, but the bolded items are already sort of encapsulated in our current strategic plan and we're working on these items. Um, so we wanted to call them out specifically because they're important. Um, but then, you know, you can kind of get a sense of, you know, where things landed generally, you know, where we're lower, where we're higher. And so in this next slide here, uh, what I did is I compared the um, 2009 and 2022 survey, and you can kind of see in these categories, and I you know, picked out the items that really showed a significant change. Um, so, and usually, a, a, well, and you'll notice downward departure. So the trend is not as favorable as it was. And so I wanted to call these things out specifically so that as we're kind of thinking about you know, how we're moving forward, um, you know, we can take these things into consideration. Um, and so there, there are things that we, we know, um, sort of the variety of housing options, affordable housing, affordable quality childcare, um, street repair, street cleaning, uh, land use, recreation facilities. And then one of the other things that I wanted to call out specifically here is, you know, sort of where we stacked up in terms of, you know, city of Montpelier services versus the federal government. And I think that's important to kind of see um, as we get on, you know, and as we come out of the pandemic. Um, and then on the bottom section of this um, table, um, there were some indicators that were in this survey that weren't in the last survey, but I thought were worth noting um, because for instance, the value of services for taxes, you know, is at 44%. So we just may want to consider that. Um, keep going here. So in the lower benchmark category, these are some of the things that I pulled out from the report. Um, economic development, we we're at about 35% approval, which is, you know, sort of lower than um, the benchmark would indicate um, for, you know, other communities like ours. Um, same thing with mobility and ease of public parking, um, community development and design and residential growth. Um, and then I pulled out some of these utility infrastructure items. Um, garbage collection was one of them. So that, that, you know, I just noted it, but it's not something that we necessarily do, but the infrastructure piece I think is particularly important. Um, and then parks and recreation is a piece here at 51%. And then, you know, education and affordable childcare. Um, I didn't note, um, anything around communication in the website, I, but I did want to call it out specifically because, you know, we're working to improve our communications and we also are, I think, making strides, but. It's something that's important. It's one of the specific custom questions that we did ask as part of the survey to make sure that we can um, be more engaged. Um, so then these are also uh, other lower benchmarks, but these are the much lower category and worth noting. But um, if you're looking at sort of just the, the greatest hits here, but really looking at street repair, variety of housing and affordable housing, this is where if you wanted to drill down in the Tableau um, uh, link, you can. Um, and looking at income and um, some of the other demographic items that might be interesting. I, you know, I was playing around with it a little bit to kind of present you with some more detail here. And some of it is um, insightful in terms of, you know, the income and where people measure it up, especially around, you know, sort of the street repair. Um, and so we can talk about that a little bit more as we get on. But um, for tonight, I'm just going to keep it pretty, pretty simple with these items and just sort of noting like, where they are in comparison to other communities. And, you know, they're kind of low, but I also think that we are working on these things. They are sort of part of our planning. Um, so then a little surprise, this kind of is a nice question because it, you know, really kind of gives us a little bit of a roadmap in terms of, you know, you know what people see as the most significant issues facing Montpelier in the next five years. Um, and I, you know, I don't know that there are any surprises here, but it's, you know, good to kind of see. And so I'm now, you know, just hustling along here to the last sort of slide here, which is you know, just basically to say that like, it's really great to have done this survey to really take a look at the data, to look at where we stack up against other communities. And I think, you know, we um, really, I think need to consider as we move forward, are we achieving the desired outcomes? Um, you know, what are the next steps? How are we going to use this data? How can we, you know, 
better serve the community by, you know, data-driven analysis and taking a look at these surveys or using the tools that we have. Um, and then, you know, I, I referenced the, the survey earlier when we'll get sort of new data in terms of doing a statistically significant survey, which is the citizen community survey. Um, but we are also, we've got a new um, tool coming online soon, which we're really excited about, which will be able to give us the ability to, I mean, Poll Code does this now in terms of uh, polling folks, but this this other um, platform through Zen City will give us the ability to do um, some project planning and polling all in sort of one setup. So um, we're excited about what's to come. Um, if you have specific questions about what's in the survey um, or anything noted here, let me know, um, but just more to sort of get you thinking. Thank you so much. Um, I spent a lot of time reading the survey and getting into all the results. I, I didn't have a chance to really play around with the Tableau stuff, so I'm going to do that, though. Um, and I think you did a great job at kind of pulling out what we really need to know and highlighting the, uh, the things that we need to be concerned about. I also loved that slide with the quadrants. That was my favorite part of the whole mm -hmm. thing. And I felt like we could just take that when we start our strategic planning process and slap it up on the wall and, you know, but there's other things in here too, that I think, uh, so that's my big takeaway is that when we get into that strategic planning process, we want to be looking at this very seriously and using that to guide us um, so that we, we can have some accountability to, to the people who answered this and told us what they think. Any other comments up here? Uh, Helen. Kelly, um, I wasn't here in 2009. I moved here in 2017. But when I look at the comparison, you just show us every single item dropped. I know COVID is one of the reasons. But when I saw the 2009 uh, response, I said, I wish I moved here back then, <laughs> not later. So. Do you have any ideas why everything is suddenly down uh, when you compare to different things? And the second one, are we planning to reach out the same people next time and ask them again instead of um, in addition to reaching out new participants? Because it is also to learn their perspective if anything has changed in a positive or negative way. So uh, these are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll try to handle that because you know it, one interesting thing about this, and this was not planned, but you know in two thousand and nine we were um, sort of in the throes of the huge recession and just coming out of it, and then in two thousand and twenty two we were in COVID. So you know we're kind of looking forward to doing one of these when, well, who knows what normal will be, but uh, something that's less ca calamitous. Um, you know, my take, I mean, other than the fact that I think we need to pay attention to this and it points out the value of doing these on a more regular basis because you can, you can catch changes earlier and, and try to course correct. Um, but some of it, I think, you know, even looking at the federal government thing, like, I think there's just more cynicism out there and in more ways of communicating and more negative energy. And, and so people are viewing things, but um, certainly things like the the housing is certainly it was bad then. It's really acute now. Uh, I was actually going to comment about uh, Carrie's comment, you know, about strategic planning, and I think that's true. And I, when you look at this and you say, you know, as a group of elected officials, you all basically said housing and infrastructure and added homelessness as the top issues. And you know, I think you reflected your community pretty well, but it's good, you know, it's still helpful to see that. As I said, the recommended use of the tool is to do it every two years. Uh, and obviously it wasn't two years between 2009 and 2022. Um, to your question about asking the same people, it is a random survey. We don't actually even administer it, we, you know, Polco does. And uh, we just get their aggregated results. One of the changes, one of the nice changes that we got this time is in addition to the controlled survey we also had an open-ended people could take it online if they weren't picked so we we could get sort of the the, the not controlled and you know the the differences weren't that much 
I mean, there were some differences, but pretty much even the self-select, but that way more people could participate as well. And we got a larger thing. Donna. As much as the numbers went down, I was impressed it didn't go down more because I find the climate just so much more demanding and challenging and everybody's mindset. So uh, I, I take everything note, but I, I'm glad we didn't score lower. <laughs> Lauren. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything and I'm glad that we're, I think, very focused on the issues that really jumped out from the survey. Um, I think part of it too, and I don't know, given the cynicism that's out there right now, but, you know, some of it too is like, how do we better communicate, you know, just the uh, meeting we had on roads and the water conversation tonight and so on, like, to, to demonstrate progress, even though it's not like any of these problems that you snap a finger and it's immediately fixed, but how are we being committed to addressing these issues that are high priority for people and demonstrating the value of the tax dollars that people are paying and knowing it's a lot of money because we have big problems and we are trying to put them to good use to fix them and address you know our community's needs. So I think that's part two of the overall, you know what we need to be doing. Any other members? Yes, so I think this kind of uh, exercise is really valuable. I I come from a magazine background where after every issue we we included in every issue we included a, sur a survey from the readers and we I wish I'd gotten results you know the number of results that you guys got but they were all valuable because it it told us you know what what our audience was thinking of what we were doing, what their problems were, what we were not addressing as much as what we were addressing. So I, I wouldn't, I would do them as often as we, as we could afford to. Spend the money. And we kept saying no, because things were so tight. <laughs> so True. You got support here, Bill, you may get it every two years. You know, put half in every year. <laughs> which I know we talked about doing before, but good idea. Tim, were you going to say, okay, uh, Peter Kelman, maybe uh, other public. Uh, Peter Kelman, Montpelier, uh, Mountain, Mountain View. Um, I spent quite a bit of time with the report and actually I, I looked at the preliminary report when it was, uh, when Bill first uh, introduced it. Um, I, I'm glad to hear all of you saying what you're saying, which is we need to look at users to, look at the things that we can improve on. The report itself doesn't communicate that. The first, the first 40 pages are all in terms of measuring positivity. Imagine if they had been in terms of, of reflecting the negative or the things that need to be looked at, which I did and I sent to all of you. Um, the second thing is that this comparison to other communities, I think we need to be a little careful about that. And in some ways, who the heck cares how we compare to other communities? What matters is how we communicate our values here in, Mo in, in Montpelier. So uh, this benchmarking, I think, is a little mm, not very useful. The, um, uh, the, the, the what, what is it? I'm sorry. What is it called? <laughs> the tableau. I, I couldn't find that. And uh, Bill sent me a link and I couldn't find it. That's where you can really find out some very important things, where you can drill down into the data and say, what groups, whether it's geographical or social class or income or renters, are feeling what about the community? Because that's really one of the things that's missing. And I just want to refer back to a couple of things that happened at the meeting today. Uh, Carrie said, because uh, I, I insisted that you uh, we, we, we look at the uh, uh, Barry uh, Rec Center off the um, uh, consent agenda. And, um, and I pointed out and I sent to all of you some alternative language because I think the language in that was badly communicated. And then Carrie said, well, now the public knows. Oh, you mean all 20 people who are at this meeting know? The public record 
are, is what was in the what was in the uh, agenda materials. And I think we need to be much more careful about what we say and, and, and say it in the right way. And so uh, Lauren said, how do we better communicate? I think that is really the key to so many of the issues here. These, don't forget, these are attitudes that are being measured. These are what people perceive. This is what people feel. And they may be feeling negative about something when, in fact, the th they don't understand it. And one of the reasons they don't understand it is, and I think, um, uh, I can't remember his name, was talking about good governance, is, is participation. What do we do to get better participation in governance? How do we encourage people to come forward to these meetings and to listen and to talk? That's okay, Donna. I'm done. Thanks, Peter. I just have one um, informational piece because I'm not going to respond to all of that, but the, the, particularly about the benchmarking, one of the values of benchmarking, and I, I agree that it, it's, you know, it's not perfect, but um, typically nationally, people rank certain services. Some services are more popular than others. So if you just look at yourself and say, uh, for example, firefighting typically scores really high. Almost every place, you know, 90% of the people approve of the fire, but the police, maybe 60%. So if you just look at it on your own, you're saying, well, people hate, you know, they're down on our police, but they're really up on our fire department. But if you look at it compared to 600 communities, you say, okay, 600 communities rank 90 for your fire department. We were 95, you know, or our police was above the benchmark because you know, there are just certain things that some people inherently just like more and are going to score higher. So you're you're getting to see it um, compared to how people. And I agree, this you know, it's not perfect, but it's like, you know, are we sort of there's to the extent that there's a standard approval rating, are you above it or below it? And it's a place to start. It is certainly not the be all and end all. And you can certainly that's the value of doing this on a regular basis because then you can say. Hey, you know, the police got 60 last year. They're up to 65 this year. And, you know, or did it go the other way? What happened? Why did it go down? And so that way you're measuring against yourself while at the same time saying, hey, you know, um, are we uh, above the standard? Because I, I bet if you looked at those same numbers across the benchmarks, they dropped every year. That I don't know that we'd have to check that, but to, to see if, or, or, and that's where you could check is, gee, is it just us that this trend is happening or? Is this just part of a national trend? And before we dismiss it as one or the other, we ought to get the data. So, okay. thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Yeah. All right. Summer schedule. Where are you guys? Look at those dedicated people back there in the dust. <laughs> we can, yeah, we can. Listen, you guys like being in the dark, you want light. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the uh, uh, summer schedule. Do you want to skip any meetings or add some extra meetings this summer? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so typically we've dropped at least one meeting, depending on what's on our plate, just because people are away and all of that. And, uh, and just... I think everyone deserves a break at some point, you know, and we have staff away. It's a lot of times. So I was proposing uh, some years we've dropped two meetings and only done one meeting like in July and August and other years we've, you know, so not knowing what your interests were, I just proposed dropping the first meeting in August with creating basically a month between July 26th and August 23rd um, where we wouldn't have any meetings um, and, you know, we, and I also noted that sometimes, depending on the timing, particularly with the reappraisal, sometimes we have to call a special meeting to set the tax rate in order to get tax bills out. But that's that might even be later this year because of, you know it's it's I mean it's televised, it's a public meeting, but it's we don't have to bring it. You know, we do it all on Zoom and just it's a math computation. So. It is ministerial, yeah. Right. It's pretty much here's the calculation you have to approve it. So, but nonetheless, um, so conversation and then I, I you know I, I didn't put in here but there had been some talk about us trying to have 
a workshop or a, a retreat meeting to talk about sort of operations and preferences and those kind of things separate from a policy content meeting. So if you want to add that in. The schedule looks good to me. I think it looks good, but I agree in terms of the kind of get going and having some kind of a board retreat just to talk about how we all do business. It'd be nice to fit one in in summer is coming up really fast. Um, and, and also I, the work session on operations, if there's a way to squeeze it in, I, it would be helpful. I guess we also talked about some of us visiting different departments and doing tours. So Kelly is supposed to be scheduling those, to, uh, not Kelly, excuse me, Mary is supposed to be scheduling those <laughs> tours. Um, yeah. So if you haven't heard from Mary, um, I know she was working on dates. So she was. Yeah. Great. So, uh, yes. Uh, workshops so that we could meet it as a council, open to the public, but really as a council, have a workshop with department heads. I feel there's a lot of background that it's missing for newer members. And it also gives us a chance to hear one another. Uh, but unfortunately, the one you have scheduled for a retreat workshop, I'm out of state from May 26th until June 10th. So I'd rather not have a retreat then. So it'd be better to do a different date. Yeah. I only picked that because it was a, a fifth Wednesday. So we had, you know, rare. Yep. It may be the only date you can do it. No, I'm sick. Terry. Yeah, um, I'm happy to skip the meeting. <laughs> it's fine with me. Um, and I love the idea of having some kind of a retreat workshop, sort of something or other, where we talk about how we work together, or whatever else we want to talk about. Um, I I am expecting for the for the foreseeable future to have an unpredictable schedule um, in terms of when I'm in town and when I'm not. So I can't. Um, I can't promise at this point when I might be physically here to participate in that. That one feels like it would be a really good one if we were all in person for and not try to do over Zoom, but I would do my absolute best to be able to be there. So I'm just going to say- Could we have it on Martha's schedule Vineyard? Schedule it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then we yeah, the put it on Zoom for in. people to watch? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, done. <laughs> Anyone else? No, Lauren? Totally agree. Uh, scheduling the 31st does work for me, but love the idea of more of a work working together uh, kind of conversation seems really helpful. Um, the only date that I am going to be camping June 28th, there's a possibility Burton Island is lovely and they do have cell service. So I could zoom in, but it'd be really nice <laughs> not to, but <laughs> anyway, everything else works for me that's proposed, but I might miss that one. I would point out for the newer council members too that it is, uh, you know, occasionally, especially summertime, someone misses meetings for whatever, you know, vacating their way in addition to the regular one. Um, so it sounds like there's general interest in having a, a workshop type meeting, um, non agenda thing. So we can, did, did, I was looking at Wednesday nights, but is that sacrosanct? You know, we don't have to have it in here. I mean, it has to be in a place that's accessible, you know, uh, accessible to the public, ideally where we could broadcast from, but mm -hmm. I mean, there's other places, so. Doesn't have to be Wednesday as far as I'm concerned. It will not be like presentations, right? It will be Maybe. real workshop, like we are doing hand-on activities. Right. So, okay. yes, it would be basically for us and what I would, we'll either get a facilitator or we'll, we'll work it out and we'll talk with everybody about what they'd like to talk about. I think it'd be more about just nuts and bolts of how the council operates and expectations of each other and staff. I, you know, maybe I, I'm not, I, I'm going to, you know, may not be the best time to have all the team here too, to go over their topics. That might be a separate workshop, maybe pre-budget or something, but I think we probably should just, you know, we just have so many new personalities to just get a sense of, you know, we had three of us, four of us talked on Monday, you know, what, what do you want to see on the consent agenda? What things do you want to get tipped off about? Just, how, how can we work best as a group? What ex expectations we have of each other and building that working relationship and all that kind of stuff. I think, you know, we haven't been able to do that for a while because of COVID and we had a fairly stable group of people for a while and now it's changed. So. 
nice that we can get out of this room. Sure. Even the police community room, we used that a few times, just out of this room. It's now like military central in there, right? Or something? No. So we rent a place at Capitol Plaza. We spent some that. of our council money. Too. Yeah. I think so. So why don't we, staff will send out some dates, figure out, uh, get, maybe get times. If you know you're going to be away for a block of time, like mm -hmm. Donna and I realize, you know, Carrie might be unpredictable. Um, and we'll see if we can figure out a place and then a, a location that meets our, because it is nice to do it. So, so our obligation is has to be open to the public. It has to be, you know, uh, ADA compliant. So, um, uh, and now, you know, in, in, now we have the zoom technology. So presumably we would want to allow for that. Um, just because not that there typically when we've done these, almost nobody comes, but it's still, it's a, it's a public discussion. And so we want to be as open and transparent as possible. So. We'll have to figure that out um, where we could do that. I don't know. It's got to be someplace. But we've had workshops where publics can be attending and present, but they really aren't part of the discussion. Correct. That's right. Okay. They don't have to be, other than the public comment at the beginning of the meeting, you, you, this is really a council conversation, but people are welcome to sit and listen. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Okay. We'll Great. get back to you on that then. Thanks. Um, council reports. Is that in this time, I think. Okay. Um, I just want to say that I did several walks in the last couple of weeks and also on the shared path. And I took pictures of some really some problems. I sent them to DPW. They called me back. It was really great. So if, if people are in communication, we can help all of us know where there are some problems that maybe that hasn't been noticed. Thank you. Uh, as I went through the um, emergency management plan, I, I know that there must be a process behind that. It, I mean, it looks like it's very sort of well organized and a uh, checklist and so on. But as I went through it, I and particularly in light of recent events um, like the motel exit, and we're talking about cold weather shelters and cooling centers and stuff, uh, I looked on. I looked through all those forms and there's really, what they're talking about, there are people who are displaced by, uh, you know, property damage. They're talking about floods and hurricanes and earthquakes. They're not really, it doesn't seem to be focused on things like climate uh, related incidents. And I just wonder if there's a way, um, I don't know who, I don't know who is responsible for the, emergency management. I mean, it's a larger group. Uh, I, I don't know how we address it, but it, it, it seems to me it would make sense, particularly in light of recent events. And even, even uh, you know, like the, the train, the chemical spills in Ohio and Indiana, wherever they were recently. I mean, there, there's one line that mentions sort of ha hazardous stuff, but, you know, I, I tried to find out what Vermont knows about hazardous materials passing through the state and I couldn't find anything, maybe because they don't want people to know. I mean, it is sort of a security. Well, I mean, they don't want the bad guys to know. But um, anyway, it was just something I noticed. And and uh, if if you guys or know or if you know someone who has access to this kind of stuff, I, I'd be happy to talk with them about uh, maybe engaging in, you know, looking looking at those types of events for a future planning. No, this, um, I, just a question, Todd. Do you think you were looking at the hazard mitigation plan? Uh, the one that was on the agenda. Yeah, the, the, the limit. Okay, okay, so yeah, so that's that's kind of a state management that's plan. That's what it looked like, yeah. That's what it's for. So, um, so it's the process is controlled by at the state level. So that, yeah. So what'll happen now is because you approved it tonight, tomorrow that'll go to uh, Central Vermont uh, Regional Planning Commission. They'll review it. They'll then pass it on to Vermont Emergency Management, and that's where the plan stays. And it's it's for like statewide emergencies. A lot of that's mm -hmm. not, it, an example of that. Um, 
after Hurricane Irene, those yeah. plans were pulled out. And I believe we sent a couple dump trucks and some drivers down to uh, Bethel to work. And then uh, Chief Fakus and myself both got called up and we spent time in the State Emergency Operations Center. And it was based on that report. Yeah. So they pull those out and they look for available resources. So that's what that is for. If we were to have another hurricane come through Vermont, and Montpelier is not affected, but other places are, they might tap into our public works department or the police chief or myself to, to fill in some of those positions. So it sounds like it makes sense then if we were to have, because if we were to have a heat event, let's say in the summer, it wouldn't be just Montpelier. It would be probably mm -hmm. statewide or right. at least one half of the state or the other, other parts of New England. Uh, so it, it's really the perfect perfect place to plan for that kind of event. It just seemed to me that it, that that particular hurricanes were clearly something that was addressed right uh cooling and, and yep. heating events not so much so right yep and I'm, and i'll it's we also have a hazard mitigation plan the city has and that you'll find that on the website okay it might be interesting look a little harder yeah yeah, yeah i didn't look uh, have a long time to we have one that started creating after the flood yeah, it's another emergency operations, but that's really Montpelier direct. Okay, right. So, yeah, good. I can help you get that information. Great. Yeah, yeah, good to know. Thank you. And I'll pass your comments on to the state about that, because that's a state oh. form we fill out. Yeah, it kind I'll, of looks I'll, like... pass, I'll pass it on to Central Vermont Regional Planning and great. See what, see what they're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate for two things this last week. Um, came across, uh, I guess I was the first person to arrive at an act and seen, um, and it can really shake you up. And it was interesting that uh, an eight or nine year old boy came across and said, do you need an adult to help? And and got his mom really quickly. Um, but I was really thrilled and, and relieved to be in Montpelier where the emergency response team with EMTs arrived in minutes. And um, I think and hope it saved someone's life too. Being there was, was pretty powerful for me. One thing, though, I is a guy who uses my phone all day long as a broker, and I was having trouble to get a 911 call out um, because I had another business call coming in. I was trying to cancel that because I didn't <laughs> want to answer it so I could dial 911. And I get home, and Doug goes, all you got to do is just push the button. And when Siri comes on, say, dial 911. Um, so for all of you, if you're ever in one of those panic moments, do that. Um, and the other thing is I want to just commend community members. Green Up Day was a huge success here. And it was so great to see everybody out with the green bags, uh, making Montpelier look better. So thanks. Uh, I am attending um, Justice Center uh, meetings as the um, city council representative and uh, they need uh, board members. So it will be great if anyone interested in supporting them uh, from public um they are looking for new members so i think it will be great um to work with them and give back something to our community and another thing i want to mention just to learn the details i know that we cannot meet like four of us right because it is not um it is against the rules uh, but i was planning i am planning to go to burlington and visit the recreation center because some people in my district um, told that it's a good uh, model to have a recreation in the middle of the town. So I was wondering if we can all go together and just like talk to them. Is, can it be like a official visit instead of me or a couple of us going? Is it possible to do that? Or we, we can also arrange other official visit to other things that we are like a shelter other things we are talking about is there any possibility thank you so you the easiest thing to do for so first of all if you want to go by yourself that's fine no that's but if you want to just, if we were as a group or uh, even contemplated it, the, the best thing to do is just warn it as a meeting and just say that you know on Whatever day, whatever time, we're going to meet at this Burlington Rec or Y or whatever it is, okay. and take a tour. And it's it's going to be it's it's open to the public. I mean, someone wants to come up and watch 
you know, so just say that's what we're doing. There's no voting action. The agenda is get the tour. And that way you've warned it and the public knows you're doing it. So, uh, you know, that's the easiest thing to do is just, and then you can do it. It's the, and, and, you know, I also just, since we're on this, you know, there might, there will be times um, when there might be four or five of you, or even all seven of you at an event or a thing like uh, we had a, press conference last night and there were five members of the Barry city council here and but you know they were not conducting business as a council they weren't discussing amongst themselves and voting and taking action they just happened to be here so you're you know you're all entitled to be together if you attend something it's if you then afterwards say well you know what now let's discuss what we just heard but if you know if you all went to the same school play or the same sporting event or just even Green up day or march in the parade, you know, those kind of things. I mean, those you can do that. You just can't really discuss business, right? The, the quorum call after the meetings. You have to be careful of having a quorum. Uh, those kind of things. So thank you for sharing your microphone tonight, Kayla. Um, just quickly, uh First, I was just grateful that the city leadership, including Bill and our mayor, were speaking out on the urgency of the people who are going to be uh, put out of the shelter soon and the impact that's going to have on those people and our communities. Um, so thank you um, for elevating that issue and hope we can continue speaking out as a community. Um, and only other thing was it might be good to invite our delegation after they hopefully adjourn soon um, and we can get the download on what did and didn't happen from our policy agenda and any you know potential implications for the city that we should be aware of. Thanks. And as the homelessness issue, we, we did have an event. Uh, I think uh, probably Bill and Sue Minter were as responsible as anyone else for putting it together. Uh, with the leadership for the uh, local municipalities, especially uh, Montpelier, Barry, and uh, and Berlin, and, and also some uh, service providers, including uh, uh, Capstone Community Action, uh, Washington County Mental Health, the Good Samaritan Haven, and the Family Center. Yep. And in another way, and it was very, very well attended, very, uh, it, it got some, I thought, very good uh, exposure. We got coverage on both WCAX and, and WPTZ, um, and our city manager's uh, remarks were extensively covered on WPTZ, uh, which was, which was great because he was, uh, comprehensive, uh, eloquent, and professional, as always. Um, where things stand now is that uh, people have been, ad advocates have been working to try to get money into the budget to uh, extend the uh, emergency housing program. The uh, conference committee on the budget uh, adjourned without putting any more money back into the budget for this uh, proposal. And there is uh, now a group of, uh, you know, it's been expected for uh, some weeks that the governor is going to veto the budget. And uh, there's a group of uh, now over 30 representatives who are saying that they are not going to vote to overturn the governor's uh, veto as a way of putting pressure to uh, to get this money back into the budget. And I don't know what's going to happen. I do know that uh, both of our city's representatives, Connor Casey and Kate McCann, have signed on to that list. And so it, it's a fight all the way to the end and we don't know how it's gonna come out. Um, but meanwhile, we're also, and Bill will probably talk more about this, working on continuing to meet to talk about uh, ways to address the uh, inevitable problem. Um, two, um, uh, you may remember that uh, a couple of meetings ago, a gentleman came to us in the uh, at a council meeting to say, well, 
turkey hunting season is coming up and what happens on uh, Country Club Road property. And Linda Berger, a, a member of the community, contacted uh, me and Bill the other day saying, did you ever give that guy uh, an answer about whether turkey hunting is going to be allowed? And it turns out that is something that we voted on last fall. Uh, it's not just deer hunting. Any uh, hunting that was previously allowed is uh, is unchanged. So people can go out and hunt their turkeys on the Country Club Road property if they want. And last, uh, tomorrow, the annual event, corp the Corporate Cup race is going to be out there. Um, it lo it's looking like a beautiful day for a race. So... Uh, I expect a lot of people will be out there and just pay attention to the traffic impacts. And that's it for me. City Clerk, do you have anything from uh, the other end of the uh, internet? The other end of the universe. Um, yeah, I just mentioned that I'm away this week of uh, a family health emergency. And unfortunately, uh, my deputy, Sarah, uh, who would have been there tonight, but she had to go away on an even more urgent health emergency. So, that means for the rest of the week, the clerk's um, office is going to have limited services. Um, so you can still do payments. Uh, you can still talk about your water and your tax bills, but um, there's not going to be a help available to do uh, vault searches for land records or vital records. So I know most people who come in already know how to do it, but um, but there won't be a lot of help available. There won't be licenses, vital records available for folks. And uh, I hate to put people in that situation, but uh, thank you all for your patience. Um, I also just want to mention having one of those meetings sitting here again today, being glad that I'm not any of y'all. And um, I uh, last couple of years, it's been pretty easy on me because election administrators are, are hip these days. So I get a lot of people thanking me for, you know, for being an election administrator. So I just want to give you all a clean thank you for what you all are doing. Not a thank you, but you're doing it wrong. Not a thank you. Now let me just, you know, whatever, just thank you and better you all than me. So. All right. Thanks, John. I hope things come out okay with your family issues. Um, Bill. Okay. I'll try to be brief. We didn't have the event last night uh, that the mayor referenced. I won't rehash that again. Uh, we are continuing to work with our neighboring communities and the nonprofit people. We have a meeting, a couple of us are meeting with the secretary of AHS on Friday to try to share with her some of the ideas that came out of this meeting to see where we get. And then the the work group, not we're not gonna have another public event, but the work group has got a meeting scheduled for next week. So both the nonprofit service providers and the municipalities to continue talking about uh, ideas that we can do. I think, you know, it's frustrating because we have such limited resources, including, you know, the urgency of finding a shelter place for this winter. But, um, you know, really what right now we're focused on what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks as people come out. So it's a, it's a big issue, obviously. Uh, Kelly mentioned this and I'll put more in the weekly memo, but we are excited. We did uh, make a commitment. We're, we're uh, creating this new Zen. We're not creating, we're buying a new software package. It's relatively inexpensive. It's called Zen city. And it's uh, it's a public engagement thing. And, and I can show you some of the, at some point we'll give you a demonstration, but it it's really great. A lot of communities are using it and, it's got project pages you click on it's got all the documents it could you know you can we can put surveys up ask for and you get the results in live time you can have public comment on them you can have even maps people can drop you know where would you like such and such and they can put it on the map and you see where they want it and uh it's it's uh it's going to be a great tool we're really looking forward to it and it can be any kind of project whether it's the city master plan or the country club road project or paving a road you know it's just information here's so Looking forward to it. And it got the, the sign of approval from Evelyn, who's actually going to be doing it. So uh, that was the, the real decision maker. So that's all I have for tonight. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, last week, I suggested, you know, people are having a hard time dealing, interacting with the new uh, agenda site. And uh, and so I suggested, well, why, why don't we put up a video so explaining on, for people on how they can uh, manage it and Evelyn put it up and it's uh, 
hopefully it's going to be very useful to people. Uh, and once you get into it once, it's manageable. But every time there's a new change to a new system, it's a challenge for people. So thanks, Evelyn. That's awesome. Okay. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. And without objection, we'll be adjourned at 10.50 p.m. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>